Chapter 41 I'm sorry I involved you in this, she said. They sat side by side on the ledge that ran along the near wall of the stone-vaulted chamber. She had her knees drawn up to her chest, her arms wrapped around her legs so that she could hug them close. He had set the lantern next to her on the ledge, but its feeble warmth provided a pitiful defense against the cold gloom of the subterranean room. He turned his head to look at her. She'd lost most of her pins. Her hair was coming down, falling in artless disarray about her face. It made her look uncharacteristically approachable. He said, I involved myself. Why? That frown line appeared again between her eyes as she studied his face. Why do you involve yourself in the investigation of murder? He tilted back his head his gaze on the ancient vaulting above. I've been told it's a form of arrogance, thinking I can solve a mystery that baffles others. But that's not why you do it. He felt a smile curve his lips. No. It's the victims, isn't it? That's why you do it. For them. He said, It's why you involved yourself in this mess, isn't it? For the woman who died in your arms. She was silent for a moment. He could hear the distant drip of water, feel the weight of a thousand tons of earth pressing down on them. She said, I'd like to think so, but I have the most lowering reflection that I've been doing it for myself. Yourself? She shifted restlessly, edging ever so slightly closer to him. If she'd been any other woman, he would have offered her the warmth of his body, for his sake as well as hers but one did not offer to hold Lord Jarvis's daughter, even if she was freezing and about to die. She said, My father thinks I involve myself in reform because I have a maudling attraction to good works. He doesn't know you well, does he? She surprised him by letting out a soft huff of laughter. In that way, no. I'm not a charitable person. I work for reform out of a sense of what's right, a conviction that things ought to be different. It's far more intellectual than emotional. I think you're being too severe with yourself. No. I concern myself with the fate of the poor women and children of London the way I might concern myself with the well-being of cart horses. I empathize with them as fellow creatures, but I certainly never imagined I could ever find myself in their position. But then... She broke off, swallowed, and tried again. Then I met Rose. Rachel Fairchild, and I realized there was a woman like me, a woman born into wealth and privilege who had danced at Almack's and driven in her carriage in Hyde Park, and yet somehow she had ended up there, at the Magdalen House. That's when I think for the first time I truly understood, there but for the grace of God go I. He swung his head to look at her. The light from the lantern limbed the proud lines of her face with a soft glow, touched her hair with a fire it lacked by the light of day. He said, So that's why you set yourself to discover who she was and why she was killed? Out of guilt? Because your life remained privileged and safe while hers fell apart? A trembling smile touched her lips. I'm not exactly safe now, am I? She shivered and he reached awkwardly out to draw her against the heat of his body. He expected her to resist, but all she said was, I am so scared. He chafed his hands up and down the cold flesh of her arms, rested his chin on the top of her head, and held her close. So am I. At one point, she said, Tell me about your time in the army. And so he talked to her about the places he'd been and about the war. He found himself telling her things he'd never told anyone, not even Cat. He talked to her about the things he'd seen and the things he'd done, and why in the end he'd realized he had to leave it all behind or lose himself in a world where everything he believed in could be sacrificed for a chimera. When he fell silent after a time, she said, Don't stop, please. Just talk. And so he did. She said to him, If we die here today, what will you regret never having done? He tightened his arms around her, 
holding her so that her back was against his bare chest. Holding her that way, he couldn't see her face, and she couldn't see him. After a moment's thought, he said, I suppose I regret having failed my father. The one thing above all else he wanted of me was that I marry and sire an heir. I didn't do that. He hesitated. Why? What do you regret? She leaned her head back against his shoulder. So many things. I've always wanted to travel, sail up the Nile, explore the jungles of Africa, cross the deserts of Mesopotamia to the land of the Hindu Kush. He found himself smiling. I can see you doing that. What else? She too was quiet for a moment. He felt her chest rise with a deeply drawn breath, then fall. I regret never having known what it's like to have a child of my own, which is an odd thing to realize since I never intended to marry. You didn't? Why not? A woman who marries in England today consigns herself to a legal status little different from that occupied by slaves in America. Ah, you're a student of Mary Wollstonecraft. She twisted around to look up at him. You know of her work? That surprises you. Yes, he said. She married. I know. I've never been able to figure out why. He smiled against her hair. You wouldn't. A silence stretched out, filled with awareness of things said and unsaid. And then the big bell of St. Clement's began to toll the hour, followed by its echo. Five o'clock. Oh, God. She pushed away from him, thrusting up from the ledge to stalk across the shadowy chamber to where the pile of rubble separated them from the river. She stood with her back to him, her hands coming to rake the loose hair from her face her fingers clenching together behind her neck. When the chimes of St. Clement's began to play Lasso Glory, she shifted her hands to cover her ears, as if to block out the sound. I don't want to die. Not yet. Not here. Not like this. He went to her, drawing her back into the comfort of his arms. She turned toward him, her face lifting to his. Her kiss was a maiden's kiss driven by fear and desperation rather than lust. And he clung to her as fervently as she clung to him, because he knew her horror and shared it. He heard her breath catch, felt her body arch against his as the bells of St. Clement's echoed away into stillness. He knew a strange sense of wonder, like a man awakening from a long, drugged sleep. And he thought, this is what life feels like. This is what a woman feels like. Skin soft, heart pounding against his, her hand guiding his to all the secret places she'd never been touched. No restraints now. No strictures of society that could stand in the face of looming death. Picking her up, he carried her back to where the lantern cast a pool of golden warmth. He felt her eyes watching him as he eased her down beneath him. He said, tell me this is what you want. In answer, she slid her hands up to his neck and wrapped her legs around his waist. She kept her eyes wide open when he entered her. She cried out once, sharply, her breath coming in quick little pants. He tasted the tears spilling wetly down her cheeks. He said, I can stop. She said, don't stop and closed her eyes. Fiercely she held him to her, as if she could, in this last act of defiance, and by sheer force of will, hold on to life itself. He'd thought himself dead within, had at times found himself wishing for death. Ironic that he should be so aware of the life coursing through him now, when he was about to lose it. Hold me, she whispered, her breath warm against his ear her fingers curling into his shoulders. He'd known somehow that she would taste like this, feel like this. As he loomed over her in the flickering darkness, she said, The French call it le petit mort. I've always wondered why. And he said, What could be more intimate than to die together?
Afterward, he smoothed the damp hair away from her high forehead. His hand shook, his breath still coming hard and fast. Then he stilled, his attention caught by a distant sound. She seemed to sense his tension. What is it? she asked, or started to ask. Except by then the sound was unmistakable. It was the relentless surge of rushing water. Chapter 42 Thrusting up from the ledge where they had lain together, Sebastian scrambled into his britches and reached for the lantern. The candle was nearly gone now, guttering in its socket as he held the lantern high. For a moment the light dimmed and almost went out. The water was a black torrent seeping through the rubble fill. He grabbed Hero's hand, dragging her with him to the iron gate. Already he could feel the water cold against his feet. Climb up onto the crosspiece of the gate, he shouted. She clung to the iron bars, her eyes huge in a pale face, her hair loose around her. She said, throw the lantern. His gaze met hers. Throw it, she said. It might ignite the clothes. It was one last crazy gesture of defiance. He eased the battered tin and horn cylinder between the bars, transferring his grip to the base. It was awkward throwing it that way, the hot metal burning his fingers. The lantern soared up the stair shaft, the light flickering over stone coffers and worn steps. Then it slammed against the wooden door in a rending of tin and horn, and they were plunged into darkness. He moved to stand behind her, his body close to hers. The water was already lapping at their ankles. He said, When the water gets too high, you must stand on my shoulders. Her teeth were clenched so tightly against the numbing strain of cold and fear that she could barely push out the words. To buy myself an extra minute? No. He rested his cheek against her hair, his body bracketing hers, his grip on the iron bars tightening as he felt the tug of the water swirling around his legs. She said, I never liked you. What an irony that we should die together and he laughed. The water was at his hips when he heard the scraping of a bolt being drawn back above. He stiffened, anger surging through him. It seems our murderers have misjudged the tide, he said softly against her ear. Her head came up, her body jerking as sunlight flooded in from above, and a man's puzzled voice echoed down to them. What the bloody hell? There's a pile of burned clothes here. That must have been what started the fire. Only what the bloody hell? Help! she screamed. Help us, quickly! Sebastian added his voice to hers. We're trapped down here behind a gate and the tide is coming in. Get a crowbar to break the padlock chain, quickly! The stairwell filled with gruff voices and the clomp of heavy boots tramping down the steps to splash through the water that crept ever higher. A giant of a man with red hair and a full blonde beard eased one end of a crowbar into the loops of the padlocked chain, his face purpling with strain as he broke the links. What the hell are you doing down here? he asked as Hero Jarvis, her wet shift clinging to her skin, fell against him. Helping hands reached out to grip them, drag them up to the light and fresh air, and the blessed unexpected warmth of the late afternoon sun. A blanket appeared, passed from hand to hand. Miss Jarvis clenched it around her like a cloak, her face so pinched with cold, her lips were blue. Sebastian took a deep gulp from a brandy flask pressed into his hands and said, How did you know? One of their rescuers, the red-haired giant with the bushy beard, said, We smelled smoke. Ain't nothing a lumberman fears more than fire, so we come to investigate. Sebastian's gaze fell to the charred vegetation at his feet, and he realized some of the clothes they'd thrown to the top of the stairs must have wedged into the gap between the bottom of the old door and the worn lintel beneath. The fire might have gone out in the stairwell, but at some point it had obviously burned beneath the door enough to catch the long, lank grass of the Duke of Somerset's ruined, forgotten garden and set it alight. The crowd around them was growing. Smocked workmen from the timber wharf and ostlers from the livery jostled with barmaids from the crow and magpie. 
Sebastian noticed Miss Jarvis studying the sea of curious faces, searching the assembly for their would-be murderers. Are they here? he whispered, leaning in close to her. But she only shivered and shook her head. He found his purse in the pocket of his ruined coat amid the pile of charred clothes at the top of the stairs, and stood for a round of drinks at the Crow and Magpie. A cheer went up as the crowd surged toward the inn. A strapping barmaid eyed the coins in Sebastian's hand, and offered to sell the lady her best spare dress. And I got me a good stout cloak too, said the barmaid. What you could buy? Get the lady out of this, said Sebastian pressing a coin into her hand, and see that she has some hot water to wash. The barmaid's eyes widened. We got a real nice chamber upstairs where she can clean up, said the barmaid, shepherding Miss Jarvis toward the stairs. For one instant, Lord Jarvis's daughter turned, her gaze meeting his over the heads of the noisy throng. Then she was gone. Half an hour later, he put her into a hackney carriage and gave the driver an address a block from her own home. It was the first private moment Sebastian had had with her, and before he shut the door on her, he managed to say, I am prepared to do the honourable thing. She snapped, Don't be ridiculous, and told the Jarvey to drive on. Alighting from the hackney a block from Berkeley Square, Hero drew the hood of her barmaid's rough cloak up around her face and walked briskly toward her house. She expected to be stared at. Instead, no one paid her any heed. She was just one more cheaply dressed woman amidst a stream of housemaids and dairymaids, shopkeepers and traders' wives. And she realized she'd caught a glimpse of the anonymity that Viscount Devlin sometimes employed so effectively in the course of his investigations. She never before understood what a heady sense of freedom it entailed. Her knock was answered by Grisham, the butler. His condescending attempts to redirect her to the airy entrance cut short when she shoved back her hood and brushed past him. Miss Jarvis, he said with a gasp, I do beg your pardon. That's quite all right, said Hero, heading for the stairs. She had the misfortune to meet her mother on the first floor landing. But Lady Jarvis simply smiled at her vaguely and said, I don't recall that cloak, Hero. The smile faded, her eyebrows puckering together. We really must consider changing your modiste. Hero gave a startled laugh. I'm simply trying it on for a costume ball. I was thinking of going as a common barmaid. Lady Jarvis pulled her chin back against her neck. I suppose you could if you wanted to, dear. But don't you think it's rather, well, common? Perhaps you're right, said Hero, as if much struck. Perhaps I'll go as Jane Seymour. She was halfway up the stairs to the second floor before Lady Jarvis said, Is there a fancy dress ball soon? I don't recall hearing about it. Goodness, I've given no thought to a costume myself. Perhaps I simply heard someone talk about the possibility of giving one said Hero, terrified by a sudden vision of Lady Jarvis bringing up the topic of the non-existent masquerade at her next soiree. Oh, said Lady Jarvis, and continued on her way down the stairs. Gaining the refuge of her own bedroom, Hero tore off her ragged clothes and rang for her maid and a hot bath. She realized she was shivering again. Wrapped in a dressing gown, she went to sit on the window seat, overlooking the square below. The dying light of the day drenched the garden's plane trees and yew hedges with a golden richness they usually lacked. Yet the scene was otherwise unaltered from the tableau she'd seen every other evening of her life in London. She could see milkmaids heading toward home, their empty pails swinging from their shoulder yokes. A lady's carriage whirled up the street toward the east, the clip clop of its horse's hooves echoing up between the tall houses. Everything was the same as it had been before. Only Hero was different. Chapter 43 It's fortunate you made your visit to Strand Lane dressed as a groom, 
said Calhoun, picking up one sodden boot between a carefully extended thumb and forefinger. From the looks of it, this lot's good for naught else but the dustman. His nose wrinkled. And from the smell of it, is it my imagination, or is the dressing room beginning to acquire a fishy odour? Sebastian settled back in his copper-hip bath and closed his eyes. I've noticed I'm becoming decidedly popular with the stable cats. Tom tells me the horses are still missing. I've set the constables to scouring every livery in the area. They may yet turn up. What was your assailant's plan, do you think? Sebastian tipped his head forward so he could probe the tender area near the base of his skull with careful fingers. They probably would have waited until after dark to remove our bodies and dump us in the river someplace. Make it look as if we'd drowned when a wherry boat overturned or some such thing. Calhoun bundled the ruined boots and breeches together, then hesitated. And would you still be interested in the whereabouts of Hesse Abrahams from the Orchard Street Academy? Sebastian glanced around. You found her? The valet was looking unusually serious. Not exactly, but of someone you'll want to be talking to. Oh? A woman named Maggie McQueen. Until two nights ago, she was a charwoman at the academy. She left when she decided the atmosphere of the place was becoming unhealthy. Unhealthy? Lethal. She knows what happened to Hesse Abrahams. According to Maggie McQueen, Hesse is dead. Sebastian decided to take his town carriage. His head ached, and despite the hot bath, he was still occasionally racked by chills. If you don't mind my saying so, my lord, you look like the devil, commented Calhoun, taking the forward seat. Sebastian sneezed. I feel like the devil. Darkness had fallen, enveloping the city in a starless black blanket. They rode through streets lit by the flickering light of carriage lamps and the torches of running link boys. A light rain had begun to fall, glazing the paving stones with a slick wetness and driving indoors the throngs that usually crowded around the city's grog shops. Their destination proved to be an unsavory flash house in a back alley in Stepney called the Blue Anchor, owned by Calhoun's notorious mother. The timbers of the jutting upper story were grey with age. Passing drays had knocked bricks off the corners of the ground floor, so that the building gave the appearance of an old man missing half his teeth. But inside, the blue anchor was warm and snug. Its ancient bar, booths and wainscoting might be black with age, but the public room smelled pleasantly of beeswax mingled with ale and gin. Sebastian sneezed again. This is the infamous blue anchor. Not what you were expecting, my lord, said Calhoun. He led the way to a cabinet behind the stairs. I won't be a moment. Sebastian subsided into one of the comfortably worn chairs beside the fire, closed his eyes, and listened to the pounding in his head. Calhoun was back all too soon with a glass of hot rum punch for Sebastian, and a wizened little woman with lank grey hair, a broad nose, and unexpectedly bright black eyes. Your lordship, this is Maggie McQueen, said Calhoun, steering her toward the seat opposite Sebastian. Now, Maggie, I want you to tell his lordship everything you told me. Maggie ran her shrewd gaze over Sebastian and evidently found him wanting. What the bloody hell happened to you? she demanded in a thick Geordie accent. I suppose you could say I fell in the river. It wasn't strictly true, of course, since the river had come to him, but he didn't feel up to explaining it. Maggie grunted. Air brain thing to have done. Were you fox, then? I'm afraid I don't have that excuse. She grunted again. The boy here. He tells us you're interested in what happened at the academy a week ago Wednesday night. It took Sebastian a moment to realize that, by the boy, she meant Jules Calhoun. Very interested, said Sebastian, taking a sip of his hot rum punch. A tingling warmth began to spread through his body. Mind you, I never could make sense of it at all, said Maggie, extracting a white clay pipe from some hidden pocket and beginning to pack it with tobacco. But then I didn't think anyone could, except maybe them two whores, 
and they're long gone now, aren't they? As long as he remembered that ah meant I, and that Geordies liked to put as many vowels as possible into a word, Sebastian figured he might be able to get through the conversation. He said, You mean Rose Fletcher and Hannah Green? That's right. It wasn't until after we found the bodies that anyone even noticed they'd oop and disappeared. Bodies, said Sebastian. Maggie kindled a spill and held the glowing end to her pipe, her cheeks hollowed as she sucked. Sebastian waited with mounting impatience until the tobacco caught, and she drew on it several times, blowing out a stream of fragrant smoke. Bodies, she said. Only the way she said it, it came out sounding like boodies. Men or women? One man, one woman. Sebastian sat forward, the rum punch clasped in both hands. He breathed in the fragrant fumes of allspice cinnamon and hot rum, and felt the pounding in his head begin to ease. Do you know who they were? I didn't know nothing about the man, except he was a customer, but the dead girl, she was S.E. Abrams. They were found together. Ach, no. The man, he was in the Chinese room, while our Essie was in the peep room near the back stairs. The peep room? For them that likes to watch, said Maggie, without a trace of embarrassment or coquetry. Sebastian exchanged glances with the Calhoun. They had started out investigating the death of one young woman shot down in an alley, but the number of dead just kept multiplying. He said, The dead man in the Chinese room. Whose customer was he? Why, he was Rose's. Sebastian took a long, thoughtful sip of his punch. Can you tell me what he looked like? Maggie drew on her pipe, her eyes half-closing in thought. He was young. She subjected Sebastian to a moment's scrutiny, then said, About your age, I'd say. Maybe a mite older, maybe a mite younger. But fur, like the boy here. She glanced at Calhoun. Can't remember anything remarkable about him, except he had a scar across his belly, like this. She drew a diagonal line across her stomach. He was naked. Maggie nodded. Some men just drop their breeches and get down to it, but this one he'd paid for a whole hour. How did he die, do you know? Maggie shrugged. Stabbed, I suppose, leastways he was sure bleeded all over the place. Took us forever to clean it all up. She hesitated. Didn't see a chur, though. A what? A knife, supplied Calhoun. Ah. Sebastian fortified himself with more punch. What about the man who was with Hannah Green, he asked. Did you see him? No, but I heard him all right. He raised quite a ruckus on account of her going off and leaving him like that. Miss Lil had to give him his money back. Ian Kane wasn't there. Not then, no. Miss Lil sent for him after she found the bodies. What did Kane do with them? Sebastian asked, intrigued. The bodies, I mean. Maggie McQueen narrowed her eyes against the smoke of her pipe. You ask a powerful lot of questions for a lord. She cast a sideways glance at Calhoun. You sure he's a real lord? The bona fide article, said Calhoun solemnly. The bodies, prompted Sebastian. What did Kane do with them? She shrugged. Dumped them someplace. I didn't know where. What else was he going to do with them? Calling the magistrates? She gave a low, earthy chuckle. Sebastian glanced at his valet. I didn't know where? Calhoun leaned in to whisper. I don't know where. Who? Oh, said Sebastian. Tipping back his head, he drained his glass. The movement made him vaguely dizzy, so that it was a moment before he could say, The man who was with Hesse Abrahams, her customer, did you see him? Nah, I suppose he walked out the house alive. I only seen the dead man because I helped wrap him in a length of canvas so Thackeray could carry him out the house, she added by way of explanation. Thackeray, he used to be a gentleman of the fancy. Ah, oh, yes, said Sebastian remembering the pugilist with the broken nose and cauliflower ear. I believe I met Mr. Thackeray. Maggie McQueen squinted at him through a cloud of tobacco smoke. You don't look so good. Too many late nights will do that to you. Indeed they will, agreed Sebastian. 
How well did you know Rose Fletcher? No, uh. Maggie gave a harsh laugh that ended in a cough. I'm a charwoman. You think they're more as it ought to do with the likes of us? But you knew who she was. Maggie sucked on her pipe. Aye, she was the one who cried all the time, when she thought no one was looking, of course, but Maggie sees more than most. Why do you think she cried? Why do you think she cried? said Maggie scornfully. Why does any woman cry? Sebastian studied Maggie McQueen's bright dark eyes, age-worn face, and work-gnarled hands. Do they cry much? he asked quietly. The women of the Orchard Street Academy. Maggie shook her head. Not most of them. Most of them have more than they ever dreamed of. Plenty of food, a roof over their heads, nice clothes. But Rose, that one. Maggie hesitated, the smoke from her pipe drifting up to waft around her head. She grew up dreaming of all things. Yet still she stayed, Sebastian thought, caught in a purgatory of her own making, trapped by self-loathing and misplaced guilt and suffering for the sins of others. Aloud, he said, Why did you leave the academy? Maggie knocked the ashes out of her pipe against the hearth and prepared to stand up. You come round asking questions, they got nervous. They? She shrugged. Mr. Kane, Miss Lil, fuckery. I seen them looking at us, wondering if I'd squawk. All women like us who'd notice if I disappeared one day. So I disappeared myself, I thought they could make us disappear. She hawked up a mouthful of phlegm and shot it at a nearby spittoon with flawless accuracy. Did you see Hesse Abraham's body? asked Sebastian. Of course I did. I wrapped it in canvas, too. Was she stabbed as well? Maggie pushed to her feet. No, to her no blood on her. Somebody gone and snapped her neck, juice like a chicken ready for the pot. Chapter 44 Saturday, 9th of May, 1812 The Black Dragon lay somber and quiet in the cold light of early dawn a dark lair for the shadowy prince of an underground realm of sin and despair. Ian Kane might not have all the answers to what had happened at the Orchard Street Academy on that fateful Wednesday night, but Sebastian had no doubt the Lancashire man knew more about those events than his charwoman. The problem would be getting close enough to the man to question him. Sebastian watched the tavern for a time from across the street where a scattering of ashes and a black scorch mark on the broken paving stones marked the spot once occupied by the hot potato cellar. A few men turned to stare at him as they passed, their jaws unshaven, their eyes sunken. But the streets were largely empty. This was a district that really only came to life in the afternoon and evening. A noisome alley ran along the south side of the tavern. Crossing the street, Sebastian took a deep breath and ducked down the passageway, his boot heels crunching the debris of broken bottles and oyster shells and rain-sodden playbills that fluttered half-heartedly in the breeze. Like most alleys in London, this one served the area's residents as an outdoor chamber pot. It made a change from the smell of fish, but he doubted Calhoun would consider it an improvement. After his last visit to the Black Dragon, Sebastian suspected his chances of simply strolling in the front door unmolested were limited. He needed a less direct entrance. He found the door that opened onto the alley from the tavern's kitchens, and just beyond it, a flight of rickety wooden steps that led up to the first floor. Beyond that, the alley ended abruptly in a high brick wall. Sebastian was standing at the base of the stairs and considering his options when the kitchen door opened behind him. He swung around to see a burly man wearing a brown corduroy coat back into the alley as he wrestled with an overflowing dustbin. He was followed by a second man with a broken nose and cauliflower ear, who dumped an armload of broken-up crates to the side of the door, then straightened. Sebastian recognized Thackeray, the ex-pugilist from the Orchard Street Academy. Well, well, said Thackeray his small black eyes lighting up at the sight of Sebastian. 
Look what we got here. His smile widened to show his broken brown teeth. I see you forgot your bloody walking stick. With a brick wall behind him and two thugs in front of him, Sebastian's options had suddenly become limited. He took a step forward and slammed his boot heel into the pugilist's right knee. That's the one I hit before, isn't it? he said, as the ex-fighter went down with a howl. What the hell? The burly man in brown corduroy set down his dustbin with a thump and reached inside it to pull out a broken bottle. You know this cove, Thackeray? Moving into the centre of the passageway, he crouched down into a street fighter's stance. The broken bottle held like a knife. Looks like you wandered down the wrong alley, he said to Sebastian. One hand clamped to his knee, Thackeray staggered up to lean against the soot-stained brick wall behind him, his breath coming hard and fast. Sebastian kicked again, this time aiming at the dustbin. It toppled over with a cascading crash of broken glass and animal bones that knocked the other man off his feet in a swirl of stinking refuse. Leaping over the strewn garbage, Sebastian managed to take two steps toward the mouth of the alley before Thackeray came off the wall at him. Big and enraged, the man caught Sebastian in a rush that carried him across the alley to slam him up against the far wall. The impact sent the breath whooshing out of Sebastian. He was dimly aware of light spilling down the steps as the door to the first floor opened above them. Then Thackeray picked Sebastian up bodily and pinned him to the bricks. Gripping his hands together, Sebastian pyramided his forearms and drove them up, intending to break the pugilist's grip on his jacket. It didn't work. Nonplussed, he hammered his doubled fist down into the man's face. Thackeray grunted, but stood firm. His hands still locked together, Sebastian swung his doubled fists back, then slammed them into the side of Thackeray's head. He still didn't budge. That's enough, said Ian Kane from the top of the steps. Let him go. Thackeray hesitated. You heard me. Let him go. Breathing heavily, his face red. Thackeray took a step back and let Sebastian slide down the wall. Sebastian straightened his lapels and adjusted the folds of his cravat. Since you're here, you might as well come up, said Ian Kane, resplendent in buckskin breeches and a silk paisley dressing gown in swirls of red and blue. Thank you, said Sebastian, aware of Thackeray's angry gaze following him as he picked up his hat and mounted the steps. So mail, asked Kane leading the way into a comfortable old parlour, with gleaming wainscoting and an elaborately carved stone hearth. Please, said Sebastian, his gaze on the carved caryatids holding up the mantel. Lovely piece. Yes, it is, isn't it? Sebastian surveyed the damage to his hat. I've been hearing some interesting tales about the Academy. You know what they say said Kane, going to pour two glasses of ale. You don't want to be believed in everything you hear. No denying that, agreed Sebastian. For instance, I heard there were only two women missing from your house, Rose Fletcher and Hannah Green. Now I discover there's actually a third, Hesse Abrahams. Kane's head came up just a shade too fast, but otherwise he gave nothing away. He held out one of the glasses of ale. It seems you know more about my establishment than I do. Do I? said Sebastian, taking the ale. It's my understanding Hesse Abrahams didn't run away like the others. She was murdered. Kane raised his own glass to his lips. You must have been talking to one of my competitors. They're always spreading dastardly tales about me. Actually, I've been talking to Maggie McQueen. Ah, dear Maggie, I wondered where she'd taken herself off to. Sebastian held his ale without tasting it. Something rather spectacular happened in your house on Wednesday of last week, Kane. What was it? Kane shrugged. I wasn't there. Maybe, but nothing happens in one of your houses that you don't know about. A smile lit up the other man's eyes. I heard that Bow Street magistrate, Sir William, died of an apoplectic fit in his own public office. Well, you can't believe everything you hear. 
Kane gave a short bark of laughter and went to stretch out in an upholstered seat near the fire. Very well. You like stories, Lord Devlin. I'll tell you a story. Once upon a time, there were three gentlemen out on the town. Like most young men, they had a perennial itch in their pants. As ill luck would have it, they chose to scratch their itch at the Orchard Street Academy. They selected three Cyprians and disappeared up the stairs with them. After that, I'm afraid, the tale becomes rather murky. The next thing we know, one of the gentlemen is raising a dust because his particular bird of paradise has flown, without it seems, performing the services for which he had already handed over a substantial sum. Prime articles in my establishment do not come cheap, you understand. And his lady of choice was Hannah Green. Miss Lil was still looking for dear Hannah when she discovered Hesse, with her neck broken. You've heard this tale before. Not in its entirety, said Sebastian. And the gentleman who had selected Hesse disappeared. Like Hannah Green, said Sebastian. That's right. What about Rose Fletcher? Rose, too, had simply vanished, leaving a dead customer in her bed. Unfortunately, yes. Kane leaned back in his chair. I'm sure you understand my position. Dead bodies are not good for business. They attract all sorts of unwelcome attention from the local constabulary and scare away customers. So you what? Dump the bodies in the river? Bury them in Bethnal Green? Cain gave a slow smile. Something like that. It's an interesting story. There's just one small problem. What's that? It doesn't make any sense. Cain pressed his splayed hands to his chest in mock astonishment. Stories need to make sense. His hands fell. I'll be frank with you, my lord. I don't understand what happened that night. All I know is that a few more nights like that and the Academy will be out of business. Had you ever seen any of the three men before? Kane's lips curved up into a slow smile. You forget, my lord. I wasn't there. The dead man, then. You saw him. Did you recognize him? Believe me, Lord Devlin, I don't have the slightest idea who he was. Believe you, Mr. Kane? Now why should I believe you? Ian Kane was no longer smiling. I could have let Thackeray and Johnson kill you in the alley. Sebastian set aside his ale untouched. If the confrontation hadn't occurred in uncomfortable proximity to the Black Dragon, Sebastian doubted the brothel owner would have felt compelled to interfere. As the man said, dead bodies weren't good for business. That wasn't a matter of altruism. That was just geography. Kane stayed where he was, his head falling back as he watched Sebastian turn toward the door. Then I suggest that in the future, you choose your locales wisely. Chapter 45 Sebastian sat on the scorched, crumbling remnant of a war and breathed in the pungent smell of wet burned wood and old ash. He'd come here to what was left of the Magdalen House after leaving the Black Dragon in St. Giles. A journeyman glazier passing in the street threw him a sharp look but kept walking. Sebastian stared out over the charred jumble of debris and wondered why he hadn't seen it before. What manner of men would kill seven unknown women just to get at one? The answer was only too obvious. Men who were accustomed to killing. And no one was more accustomed to killing than military men. He thought about the girl from the cheesemonger's shop, Pippa. She'd given him a clue that first day, when she told him the gentleman she'd seen watching the Magdalen house had reminded her of some old nabob. One could always tell a nabob by his sun-darkened skin, just as one could tell the military men who had spent years under the fierce suns of India and the Sudan, Egypt and the West Indies. The sound of boot leather scraping over fallen timbers brought Sebastian's head around. What are you doing here? asked Cedric Fairchild, picking his way toward him. 
trying to make sense of all this. He studied the younger man's haggard face. What brings you here? I don't know. Cedric stood with his hands thrust into the pockets of his coat, his shoulders hunched against the dampness as he stared out over the house's shattered walls and twisted, burned contents. I can't believe she died here. I keep thinking that if I'd only managed to talk her into leaving— Don't, said Sebastian. It's not your fault. Cedric swung his head to look at him. Yes, it is. He sucked in a breath that seemed to shudder his entire frame. I was talking to Georgina, Lady Sewell, my sister. She'd heard about Rachel's death and came to see me. She told me something I didn't know. It seems that last summer, before I came home, Rachel did quarrel with Ramsay. So maybe my father was right. That is why she ran away. Sebastian's brows drew together. Would Lord Fairchild have forced her to marry Ramsay, even if she'd changed her mind? I don't know. I never thought about it. I suppose he might. He's a stickler for the proprieties, you know. And if she'd broken off her betrothal, there would doubtless have been a scandal. Sebastian watched as Pippa from the cheesemongers across the street came and stood in her shop's doorway a frown on her face as she narrowed her eyes, watching them. Cedric said, I don't understand why you're poking into the past, asking these questions about Rachel, about my family. What's any of it got to do with this? He swept his arm in a wide arc that took in the fallen blackened beams, the crumbling chimney of what was once a fireplace. I'm not certain it has anything to do with it, Sebastian admitted. Cedric's arm dropped to his side. My father's not well, you know. The news about Rachel hit him hard. You told him it was true. My sister told him. And he believed it. He accepted that she is dead. Cedric's gaze shifted away. I don't know. He said he didn't. I mean, it's hard to believe, isn't it, with her body burned like that. But he's, he's not himself. I'm worried about him. Sebastian felt his lips curl into a wry smile. You want me to stop asking questions about Rachel? Is that what you're saying? She's dead, dead and buried. Knowing what happened to her isn't going to bring her back, but it could very well kill our father. Cedric jerked his head toward the back of the burned-out house. You want to find out what happened to the women in this house, fine. But leave my family out of it. In the sudden silence that followed his outburst, Sebastian could hear the rattle of a shutter being thrust up. He glanced down at his clasped hands, then up at the other man's tight-lipped face. Cedric Fairchild might have been to war, but he suddenly looked very, very young. Sebastian said, This man who's missing, Max Ludlow, did you know him well? Cedric frowned, as if confused by the shift in subject. I've met him a few times, but I don't know him well, no. I never served with him. He was in the Hussars. Until he sold out, yes. Was he ever wounded? In Argentina, I believe. Cedric's eyes narrowed. Why? Sebastian was thinking about a dead man in a brothel room with an old scar like a saber slash running diagonally across his belly. But all he said was, Just wondering. He glanced across the street at the cheesemonger's shop. Pippa had disappeared. It don't make no sense, said Tom from his perch at the rear of Sebastian's curricle. It's near three o'clock. How can this lady Melbourne be having a picnic breakfast? Sebastian neatly feather-edged a corner. They were passing through Putney on their way to Kew, the site of Lady Melbourne's highly anticipated breakfast. Breakfasts are like morning calls, which is to say they take place in the afternoon. When you don't generally get up before midday, it shifts things a bit. You reckon this Mr. Ramsay will be there? He has a sister he's launching into society. Lady Melbourne's picnic breakfast is one of the most important events of the season. He'll be there. They arrived at Kew to find the wildflower-strewn hillside near the pagoda crowded with linen-draped tables set with gleaming silver and crystal. Cool, said Tom, 
practically falling off his perch as he craned round to stare. How they get all this out here? The servants brought the tables and trimmings in wagons and set it up before her ladyship's guests arrived. The tiger cast a thoughtful eye toward the clouds above. And if it rains? On Lady Melbourne's picnic? Sebastian handed over the reins and jumped down. It wouldn't dare. Winding his way through liveried servants and ladies with parasols, Sebastian was aware of his sister Amanda glaring at him from near the towering dragon-roofed pagoda. He deliberately avoided her, only to fall into the clutches of the Prime Minister, Spencer Percival. I'm surprised to see you here, Devlin, said Percival, hailing him. Not usually your type of scene, is it? Nor yours, I'd have said. The Prime Minister raised his wine glass with a wry grimace. I have six daughters, which means I'll be fighting flies and ants for my food for many years to come, I'm afraid. What is it about the concept of alfresco dining that so captivates the fair sex? Sebastian nodded to where the Prime Minister's daughter, a vision in white muslin and chip straw, stood laughing with a friend. It does show them to advantage, don't you agree? There is that, agreed Percival. He took another sip of his wine and said with feigned nonchalance, Your father tells me you've no interest in politics. No. The Prime Minister looked nonplussed. We could use a man like you in the House of Commons. Sebastian hid a smile. I doubt it. There's trouble brewing over the orders in council, you know. Bloody Americans. They've had their sights set on annexing Canada for thirty years now. There are reports they're planning an invasion and using the orders in council as an excuse. You're expecting a revolt in the Commons, are you? There's a formal inquiry scheduled for Monday evening session. But it's not just the Commons, it's the Lords, too. Fairchild is leading the pack. He's saying we ought to rescind the orders, appease the Americans. There's no doubt the timing would be bad for another war, said Sebastian. We're already rather occupied with Napoleon. Hence the Americans' bellicosity. It's bloody opportunism. They're learning, aren't they? said Sebastian, scanning the open hillside. He spotted Tristan Ramsay's young sister first, then the widowed Mrs. Ramsay. Tristan Ramsay himself was rapidly disappearing down a path hemmed in by rhododendrons and lilacs. Excuse me, sir, said Sebastian before the Prime Minister had a chance to launch into an impassioned defence of his much-maligned orders in council. By striking a diagonal course through the shrubbery, Sebastian came out onto the path leading toward the distant pond, just as Ramsay was casting an anxious glance back over his shoulder. If I didn't know better, Ramsay, I'd suspect you of trying to avoid me, said Sebastian stepping out from behind a cascading wisteria in full bloom. Ramsay's head snapped back around, his weak jaw sagging. Of course I'm trying to avoid you. The last time I saw you, you nearly broke my nose. Any sane man would try to avoid you. Sebastian smiled. If you didn't want to risk having your cork drawn again, you shouldn't have left the ladies. Ramsay threw a wild glance around his mouth opening and shutting soundlessly, as he realized the shrubbery effectively hid them from the view of the others. Sebastian crossed his arms at his chest and said, Tell me about the quarrel you had last summer with Rachel Fairchild. Quarrel? We didn't— You did, Ramsay. Tell me, what was it about? The man's shoulders sagged, the air leaving his chest in a long, ragged exhalation. Someone— told her things about me. I don't know who, she wouldn't say. Told her what? Ramsay's jaw tightened mulishly. A man has appetites. She discovered you kept a mistress. A mistress? No. The man seemed indignant at the thought. Laughing like that, just every once in a while. Well, you know what it's like. I can't imagine what she expected. She was always so skittish never wanting me to do more than kiss her hand, even after we were betrothed. What was I supposed to do? A man needs some relief. 
Someone told her you were in the habit of picking up prostitutes. Righteous indignation flared in Ramsay's eyes. She followed me. Can you imagine such a thing? She followed me and watched me pick up some strumpet in the haymarket. She confronted you. Not there on the street, thank God. But the next day, when I came to take her for a drive, she said the most outlandish things about how she'd thought I was different from other men. He gave a ragged laugh. Like I was supposed to be a monk or something. Sebastian stared out over a hillside covered with Turkish hazel and American sweet gum, and tried very, very hard to control his temper. I was pretty indignant, I can tell you. Ramsay's chest swelled with remembered pique. I told her all men had appetites, and while I might be content to leave her alone while we were betrothed, I expected things to be different after the wedding. Sebastian considered how a young woman like Rachel Fairchild, already traumatized by years of her father's unwanted attentions, must have reacted to a speech such as that. And so she ran away, he said softly. Ramsay bit his lip and nodded. I went back the next day to try to reason with her, maybe moderate some of the things I'd said. But she was gone. When you saw her later in Orchard Street, did she tell you how she had ended up there? Ramsay swallowed hard enough to Bobby's Adam's apple up and down. She said she met an old woman who was kind to her, or at least that's what she thought at first. Turned out the old hag was a procurus. It was an all too familiar story. Young women fallen on hard times or newly arrived from the country, befriended by helpful old women whose business it was to keep the brothels and whoremasters of the city supplied with fresh goods. Sebastian said, But she had family, friends. She could have escaped. Ramsay sniffed. I asked her why she didn't leave. And? She said the strangest thing. She said she'd spent the last ten years of her life fighting it. Only now she realized there was no use. I didn't understand. It made no sense. But when I asked what she meant, that's when she told me I only had three minutes left. His body swept by raw fury. Sebastian felt his hands curl into fists at his sides. Tristan Ramsay's eyes widened and he took a prudent step back, his arms thrust out in front as if to ward off a malevolent spirit. I told you everything. You've no call to hit me again. It wasn't the fear in Ramsay's eyes that gave Sebastian pause. What stopped him was the sweetness of that rush of anger, the ease with which the old familiar bloodlust of the battlefield could return to beguile a man. He'd seen where the seductive power of violence could lead a man. Taking a deep breath, and then another, he forced himself to uncurl his fists and walk away. Pleading a headache she didn't have, Hero begged off from accompanying her mother to Lady Melbourne's picnic, and spent the afternoon curled up on the window seat in her room with a book open on her lap. The irony of Hero Jarvis, determined spinster, succumbing to the lures of the flesh in a moment of frightened weakness, was not lost on her. She kept telling herself that with time, she would come to terms with the cascade of embarrassment and consternation in which she now floundered. Resolutely putting all thought of the incident out of her head, she just picked up her book again for perhaps the tenth time when the butler Grisham appeared to scratch at her door. There is a personage here to see you, miss. Hero looked around. A personage? Yes, miss. I hope I haven't done wrong to admit her, but I know your, um, activities do sometimes bring you into contact with a certain class of female which you would otherwise be. Hero cut him off. Where is she? I left her in the entrance hall with one of the footmen watching her. Watching her? What do you think she's going to do? Make off with the silver? The thought had occurred to me. Hero closed her book and hurried downstairs. James, the footman, stood at the base of the steps, his back pressed against the panelled wall, his arms crossed at his chest, 
his gaze never wavering from the auburn-haired woman who sat perched on the edge of one of the Queen Anne chairs lined up along the hall. She wore a spangled pink dress, striped a la polonaise, with a blatantly low décolletage decorated with burgundy-colored ribbons. A saucy hat sporting three burgundy plumes completed the stunning ensemble. Once the effect might have been jaunty, but the plumes drooped, the Cyprian's shoulders slumped, and she had one hand up to her mouth so that she could gnaw nervously on her thumbnail. Hero had never seen her before in her life. I understand you wish to see me, said Hero. The woman leapt up, her eyes wide. Now that Hero was closer, she realized that beneath the plumes and rouge, the Cyprian was no more than a girl. Sixteen, perhaps. Seventeen at the most. She was so small she barely came up to Hero's shoulder. She was visibly shaking with fear, but she notched her chin up, determined to brazen it out. You're Miss Jarvis? That's right, said Hero. The girl cast a scornful glance at the footman. I ain't here to prick your bloody silver. Then why precisely are you here, Miss? I'm Hannah, said the girl. Hannah Green. Chapter 46 Indeed, said Hero, lifting one eyebrow. She'd wondered how long it would be before hordes of tawdry Hannahs started showing up at her door. The girl frowned in confusion. I, she said slowly. Hero crossed her arms. Prove it. The girl's mouth sagged. What? You don't believe me? You can ask anybody, they'll tell you. Anybody such as whom? The girl put her hand to her forehead. Oh, she wailed, half turning away. Now what the bloody hell am I supposed to do? You could go back where you came from, suggested Hero, torn between annoyance and amusement. What, and get me neck snapped like poor Tasmin? Amusement and annoyance both fled, chased by a cold chill. Come in here. Hero put her hand on the girl's arm, plucked her into the morning room, and closed the door on the interested footman. Where precisely have you been? Hero demanded. The girl's eyes slid away, going round as they assessed the room with its yellow silk hangings and damask chairs, its gilt-framed paintings and tall mirrors. Cool, she breathed. I ain't never seen nothing like this. It makes the Academy's parlour look downright shabby, it does. Hero spared a thought for her grandmother's reaction, were she to be told that her morning room compared favourably to a brothel. After you left the Academy, said Hero, still unconvinced this ingenue really was Hannah Green, what did you do? Hannah wandered the room. Hero kept an eye on Hannah's hands. Hannah said, Rose drugged me to that bloody Magdalene house. She said we'd be safe there, that no one would think to look for us there. Hannah's lips thinned with remembered outrage. Six o'clock in the bloody morning. Understanding dawned. They made you get up at six? Not just get up. Get up and pray. For a whole bloody hour. Every day, said Hero. Aye. The first time I thought it was just some mean trick they was playing on us. But when they'd done it again the next day, I knew we were in for it. Rose didn't mind? No, said Hannah, in a voice tingled with mingled awe and exasperation. I think she actually liked it. It was scary. So what did you do? I left. I was afraid they might try to stop me. But if truth were told, I think them Quakers was glad to see the back of me. You weren't afraid to leave? Nah. I mean, I was scared when we left the academy, but after a couple of days I started thinking it was all a hum, that Rose had made it all up. She reconsidered. Well, most of it. Surely you didn't go back to the academy? Hero asked, stunned. The girl looked at her as if she were daft. You take me for a flat or something? No. I got me a room off the A-Market. She paused. Of course, 
When I heard what happened at the Magdalen House last Monday, I got scared all over again. I tried to lay low, but, well, a body's got to eat. Hero studied the girl's animated face. If she really was Hannah Green, the girl was living proof that God takes care of idiots. Tell me about Tasman, said Hero. The girl sniffed. I was working the stretch between Norris Street and the George when she found me. She said there was a gentry mort willing to pay ten pounds to talk to me, but if we were smart, we could maybe figure out a way to get more. Hero had actually offered twenty pounds to anyone who could put her in touch with Hannah Green, but Tasmin Poole had obviously been less than honest with her former co-worker. Go on. The girl's eyes slid away. Tasmin was going to write you. Tasmin was clever, you know. She could read and write like nothing you ever saw. She came up to me room to work on writing the note while I went to get her some sausage rolls. It was when I was coming back that I saw that cove going into the lodging house. A man, said Hero. What man? What do you mean, what man? said Hannah scornfully. Don't you know nothing? The same man what killed Hesse. Lady Jarvis's querulous voice could be heard raised in annoyance somewhere above stairs. Hero looked at Hannah's burgundy-plumed hat, the plunging décolletage, the glory of spangles and pink and white polonaise stripes, and said, Wait here. Yanking open the door, she found James standing patiently in the hall. Watch her, Hero told him, then hurried upstairs to furnish herself with the reticule, hat, gloves, and parasol, without which no respectable lady would be seen out of doors in London, no matter how nefarious her errand. Hannah Green sat in the hackney pulled up across from Paul Gibson's surgery, her body rigid with mulish obstinacy. I ain't going in there, she said, with all a prostitute's loathing of the medical profession. I don't need no doctor. With difficulty, Hero resisted the urge to shake the girl. That's not why we're here. You need some place safe to stay. There isn't any place else. Not that Paul Gibson's surgery was exactly safe either, Hero thought, remembering the fate of the wounded assailant she'd brought here. But she kept that information to herself. Hannah Green cast her a doubtful glance. No medical exam? No exam, promised Hero. The girl consented to get out of the hackney. Hero paid off the driver, then had to practically pull the girl across the road. Good God, said Paul Gibson, his eyes widening when he opened the door to Hero's knock. Dr. Gibson, meet Hannah Green, I think, she added, as Hannah glared at the surgeon, and Gibson continued to stare in awe at the lady's burgundy-plumed hat and spangled pink and white stripes. I'm sorry, but I had no place else to take her, said Hero, putting her hand in the small of the girl's back and giving her a push that propelled her over the threshold and into the hall. Chapter 47 Sebastian arrived back at his house in Brook Street to find a note from Paul Gibson awaiting him. The Irishman had written cryptically, I have an interesting guest I'm convinced you'll want to meet. Do come. Quickly. The word quickly was heavily underscored three times. Why all the mystery? Sebastian demanded when Gibson opened the door to him. I was concerned my message might fall into the wrong hands, said Gibson, turning to lead the way back down the hall. So who's your guest? I have two, actually. Sebastian stopped on the threshold of Gibson's parlour. Miss Jarvis stood beside the empty hearth, her gaze on the pickled pig's fetus on the mantel. She was half turned away from him, her spine as rigid and uncompromising as ever, her brown hair once again pulled back as neatly as a schoolteacher's, her forehead faintly crinkling as she stared with apparent fascination at the blob of purple-pink flesh in the jar. She looked as she had always looked, and he wondered why that had surprised him. 
as if that brief, desperate coupling in the dark should have transformed her and made her, what, soft and winsome? Hero Jarvis? What an absurd conceit. She turned then, and he had the satisfaction of seeing her lips part on a quickly indrawn breath, and he knew in that moment she too was remembering the touch of flesh against flesh, a taste of salt on a questing tongue. Then a woman's voice said, Bloody hell, you're going to make me say it all again? Looking around, he beheld a vision in spangled pink and white stripes that made him blink. He was aware of Miss Jarvis's lips curling into that malicious smile that was so much like her father's. She said, Lord Devlin, meet Hannah Green. Sebastian studied the girl's button nose and scattering of freckles. Whatever he'd been expecting, it wasn't this, this exuberant bundle of irreverence. Are you certain she really is Hannah Green? Are you bamming me? said the girl. I'd have to be daft to be claiming to be me if and I wasn't me. I don't want to be me right now. According to Hannah here, Tasmin Poole is dead, said Miss Jarvis by way of explanation. Someone snapped her neck two nights ago. It was the same cove, said Hannah, the one what come to the academy and done for Hesse. Sebastian went to pour himself a brandy. Do you know who this cove is? he asked, reaching for Gibson's decanter. Not exactly. She threw a questioning glance toward Miss Jarvis. Tell Lord Devlin what you told me about the three men who hired you out of a house last week. Sebastian looked up. When was this? Tuesday, said Hannah. They was having a party, you see. It was one of the cove's birthday, and they hired Hesse, Rose, and me for the whole night. Go on, said Sebastian splashing brandy into a glass. He silently offered some to Miss Jarvis and Gibson, but only Gibson took him up on it. We'd done it before. I don't mean for them free, Hannah hastened to add, her gaze on the brandy, but for other coves. Her face shone with saucy glee. It can get a bit naughty, if you know what I mean, but it's a lot less work than spending the night traipsing up and down the stairs at the academy. Sebastian glanced at Miss Jarvis, with her primly knotted spinster's hair and rigidly held spine. Did she have any inkling of the wild Dionysian scene conjured by Hannah Green's words? Of the kinds of things three young men could demand of the compliant women they'd bought for the night? And then it occurred to him that she probably had a better idea now than she would have twenty-four hours ago. What manner of men were they? he asked. Gentlemen, said Hannah Green, as if that said it all. Old, young, fat, thin. Pretty old, she said. Sebastian was picturing ponderous men with greying pates and drooping bellies until she added, About your age. I'm twenty-nine. He glanced over at Miss Jarvis in time to see her bring up her hand to hide a smile. He said, Did they take you to a house or to rooms? Rooms. What fancy they were, too. She cast a disparaging glance around Gibson's unpretentious parlour. More swell than this. Where were these rooms? Hannah frowned in thought. I don't rightly know. They took us there in a carriage. A gentleman's carriage? No, a hackney. Then she frowned and added, I think. Sebastian blew out his breath in a long sigh. Do you remember anything from that night at all? She grinned. Not much. I was that foxed I was. But you say you saw one of them again? All three of them. They come to the academy the very next night. Ask for Rose, Hesse and me again. Only this time they weren't hiring us off the floor. Just for an hour. So what happened? Hannah Green's gaze returned again to Sebastian's brandy. She licked her lips. Can I have one of them? When you've remembered everything, I want you clear-headed. Tell me what happened Wednesday night. Exactly. Exactly. She screwed up her face with the effort of memory. Well, I was taking off me dress when Rose comes banging on me door saying she needs to talk to me. So I goes out into the hall to tell her to go away. 
and she grabs me arm and says them three gentlemen had come to kill us. At first I thought she was bamming me, but then she drags me down the hall and shows me poor Hissy laying there with her eyes wide open and her neck bent all funny. And she tells me that she's done gone and stabbed the gent what had paid for her. I can tell you we was that spooked. Rose gave Tasmin Paul her bracelet to distract Thackeray while we nipped down the back stairs and took off. Sebastian studied the girl's animated face, unsure how much, if any, of this wild tale to believe. The man you say you saw going into your lodging house in Haymarket right before Tasmin Poole was killed, was he the man you were with Wednesday night? Hanno shook her head, her eyes wide. He's the one went with Hesse. What did he look like? I told you, he was a gentleman. Now, can I have that drink? Sebastian poured her a brandy and held it out. Dark hair or light? She took the brandy in both hands and gulped it. Dark, I think. At least, pretty dark. Paul Gibson made an incoherent sound while Sebastian asked, Tall or short? Hannah's eyes narrowed. Neither. You don't remember anything about him at all, do you? Course I do. What I'm saying is, he were an ordinary-looking cove. I'd recognize him in a minute if I was to see him again. I recognized him when I seen him in the A-market, didn't I? What about the gentleman you were with that Wednesday night? What did he look like? He were the same. Just an ordinary-looking gentleman. She twisted her mouth sideways in a thoughtful frown. Though I think maybe he weren't as dark. He was the birthday cool. Sebastian moved to refill her glass. Do you remember any of their names? I don't pay no attention to names. In my experience, most men just make up the names they give me anyway. Yet that night of the birthday party, surely the men called one another by name? She frowned. Maybe. I don't know. Like I said, I don't pay no attention to names. Was one of them named Max? She nibbled on a fingernail. Could have been. I can't say for sure, though. He was aware of Miss Jarvis's gaze upon him. He knew she was bursting to ask, And who is Max? Do you have any idea at all, Sebastian said to Hannah Green, why those men came back to the academy to kill you? Hannah downed her second brandy in a long pull. Rose said it was because she knew they was planning to murder someone. Sebastian was aware of Paul Gibson's arrested expression, of Miss Jarvis sitting forward. This was evidently one part of her tale Hannah Green had not yet told. Sebastian said, She knew, but you didn't. Why? Hannah gave a ringing laugh. Go on with you. I don't speak French. Sebastian's gaze met Miss Jarvis's. They were speaking French? Amongst themselves, yeah, said Hannah. At first, till the other cove come. Sebastian frowned. The other cove? There were four men? No, just the three. The birthday cove come later. Did Rose tell you exactly who they were planning to kill? Sure, but it didn't mean nothing to me. Some guy named Percival or something like that? Miss Jarvis's eyes widened. Spencer Percival? Hannah swung her head to look at Lord Jarvis's daughter and say, Who's he? Chapter 48 Miss Jarvis pushed up from her chair. If I might have a word with you, Lord Devlin. Of course, Miss Jarvis, he said, following her down the hall to Gibson's dining room. She stalked to the far side of the table before swinging to face him. You know something you haven't told me. What is it? Believe me, Miss Jarvis, this is the first I've heard of any link to the Prime Minister, if there is indeed any such link. So who is Max? Max Ludlow. He's a hussar captain. Or he was. He's been missing since last Wednesday. Until recently, I thought it an interesting coincidence that he disappeared the same night as Rachel Fairchild fled Orchard Street. It may still be nothing more than a coincidence. On the other hand, 
he might well be the man she killed. Miss Jarvis brought one hand to her forehead. My God, what is this? Some French plot to assassinate the Prime Minister? Hannah Green said the three men who hired them were gentlemen. She didn't say anything about them being French. Most men of their class could converse in French with ease, even after twenty years of war. But as the daughter of a French émigré, Rachel would have been fluent. And we don't know they were talking about Spencer Percival after all. Percival is a given name as well as a family name. Then why did they come back to kill those women? And why are they trying to kill us? That I do not know, Miss Jarvis. He searched her face, noting the subtle signs of strain, the brittle way she held herself. He said, Miss Jarvis, there are things we must discuss. I see no need to discuss anything, she said, gripping the back of the chair before her. What passed between us was a bizarre aberration born of an unfortunate set of circumstances and best forgotten. Only Hero Jarvis, he thought, could describe the loss of her virginity as a bizarre aberration. He said, Nevertheless, I am honor bound to offer you my hand in— Thank you, my lord, but that will not be necessary. Her cheeks darkened with what he first took for embarrassment, then realized was rage. I have no intention of allowing a moment's weakness to lead to a lifetime of regret. Sebastian could think of nothing more horrifying than finding himself united in unholy matrimony with the daughter of Lord Jarvis. But the code of honor he lived by was rigid in such matters. He said, If we had died on cue as expected, it would have been unnecessary. Since, however, we did not die, it is now Lord Devlin. I told you before that I have no intention of ever marrying. What happened yesterday has not altered that. She stared at him with her frank, faintly contemptuous grey eyes, and he found it virtually impossible to reconcile this icy, self-possessed gentlewoman with the frightened and very real woman he'd held in his arms less than twenty-four hours ago. He said, There could be consequences. Her head jerked up. There is no reason anyone need ever know. My identity was never revealed to our rescuers. I was able to re-enter my home without attracting undue attention. And I trust I may have full confidence in your honor as a gentleman that you will never speak of it to anyone. That's not what I meant. Her eyes widened in a way that told him this aspect of yesterday's interlude had yet to occur to her. She said, Fate would not be so perverse. Nevertheless, you will tell me. She brushed past him headed for the door. He reached out and snagged her arm, pulling her back around. Miss Jarvis, I must insist. Fury and scorn blazed in her eyes. She dropped her gaze to his hand on her arm. He let her go. She said, I have no desire to speak of this again. I trust that you, as a gentleman, will respect that wish. She turned once more toward the door. Nevertheless, you will tell me, if there are consequences. She checked for the briefest instant, but kept walking. As soon as they were all once again assembled in Gibson's sitting room, Miss Jarvis said tartly, Considering the fate of my wounded assailant, I don't think Hannah should stay here. What happened to him? asked the irrepressible Hannah. Someone broke his neck. Hannah's hand crept up to gently cradle her throat. For a moment, the animation seemed to drain out of her, leaving her bleak and frightened. Sebastian said, I can ask Jules Calhoun to take her to his mother. A Calhoun is my valet, he added by way of explanation when Miss Jarvis threw him a questioning glance. You would send her to your valet's mother, said Miss Jarvis, while Hannah Green let out a wail. I ain't going to nobody's bleeding mother, said Hannah. She'll make me feel like some bleeding cockroach or something. It'll be worse than the Quakers. You'd rather have your neck snapped, said Sebastian. Hannah opened, then closed her mouth. Besides, said Sebastian, I think Grace Calhoun will surprise you. This time, Hannah's mouth fell open and stayed open. 
Grace Calhoun? Your valet's mother is Grace Calhoun? You know her. Get on with you. Everybody knows Grace Calhoun. Who is Grace Calhoun? whispered Miss Jarvis to Paul Gibson. But Paul Gibson only said, Not someone you want to know. Nobly volunteering to escort Hannah Green to Brook Street, Paul Gibson went in search of a hackney. Oh, said Hannah Green, casting a long, wistful look at the curricle and pair of blood chestnuts waiting with Tom across the street. I was hoping maybe I'd get to ride in your curricle. I ain't never ridden in a rig like that afore. While Miss Jarvis turned a laugh into a cough, Sebastian said to his friend, Tell Calhoun I should be there shortly, and don't let her out of your sight until you turn her over to him. I ain't gonna pike off, said Hannah from the depths of the hackney, both hands once again wrapped around her throat. Not if you want to live, you won't, said Sebastian, stepping back. Gibson scrambled in behind her, and the hackney started with a jerk. And I must say I am surprised at you, Miss Jarvis, he added, turning to her. Laughing at the enthusiasms of those who are less fortunate than we. I wasn't laughing at Hannah, said Miss Jarvis, opening her parasol against the noonday sun. I fear I was overcome by the mental image of you driving that vision in pink and white stripes and burgundy plumes through the streets of London. It's why you sent her with Gibson, isn't it? I sent her with Gibson, because it's my intention to seek out Spencer Percival and warn him of a possible plot to assassinate him, just as soon as I drive you home. Her smile faded. Thank you, but I came by Hackney, and I intend to return by Hackney. I'm not sure that would be wise. Are you concerned about my safety or my reputation? Both. You don't even have your maid with you. Miss Jarvis looked down her aquiline nose at him. As for my reputation, I seriously doubt it will be enhanced by my driving through the streets of the city in your curricle. You've done it before. While, as for my safety, she nodded down the street toward a loitering brown-coated man who quickly glanced away when her gaze turned toward him. I have my father's watchdog to protect me. Sebastian studied the smooth line of her cheek, the proud angle of her head. Nevertheless, you will take care. Her hand tightened around the handle of her parasol. Lord Devlin, there is no need for you to concern yourself over my safety. I have always considered myself an eminently practical and capable person. You've never before been involved in murder. Yet in the past week, I have survived three separate attempts on my life. I know, he said. That's what worries me. Chapter 49 He found Spencer Percival at the Admiralty, walking rapidly toward Whitehall. Lord Devlin, said the Prime Minister when he spotted Sebastian, have you reconsidered your decision against taking up a position in the Commons? I'm afraid not, said Sebastian, glancing at the huddle of clerks who'd followed the Prime Minister down the stairs. A walk with me away. Are there something we must discuss? Percival's smile faded. If it's this business about that poor unfortunate Bellingham. Bellingham? With difficulty, Sebastian resurrected the memory of the half-mad merchant who had accosted Percival on the footpath outside Almax. No. But there is something I believe you must be made aware of. The two men turned their steps toward the parade. Last Monday, someone attacked the Friends Magdalen House in Covent Garden and killed all the women there. Percival nodded. I'd heard you'd involved yourself in their deaths. Sebastian studied the Prime Minister's open, congenial face. Where did you hear that? From your father. My father? What does he know of it? He does concern himself with your welfare, you know. Your association with these types of affairs worries him. Because he considers my involvement in murder investigations beneath my station. Because he fears for your safety. Sebastian stared out over the company of infantrymen drilling before them, their backs rigid, 
their feet rising and falling in unison. I spent six years in the army. He didn't fear for my safety then. Only every minute of every day. Sebastian looked at the man beside him. I'm sorry if my involvement in these matters causes Hendon distress, but this is something I must do. Because you enjoy it? Enjoy it? I suppose I do enjoy the mental challenge of solving a puzzle, he admitted, considering. But the swirl of emotions that inevitably surround a violent death? The hatred and envy? The grief and despair? No one could enjoy that. Percival's eyes narrowed into a frown. You're certain the women in the Magdalene house were murdered? Yes, but I'm afraid there's far more involved than that. The evidence suggests their deaths may be linked to a scheme to assassinate you. Me? Last week, a party of gentlemen hired three young prostitutes to entertain them for the night. During the course of the evening's revelries, the men became incautious enough to discuss their plans in French. I suppose they thought it unlikely that any of the women could understand their conversation, but one did. Percival gave a sharp bark of laughter. What are you suggesting? That Napoleon wants to see me dead? What would he think to gain by such an action? If the Whigs were to come to power, they might seek to end this war, but the Whigs will never come to power. Not with Pliny as regent. I don't claim to understand the motivation at work here. But two of the three women hired that night are dead, along with an uncomfortable number of the people they've come into contact with since. The one woman who survives says they were overheard discussing plans to murder someone named Percival. Now, I could be mistaken. They could be planning to kill someone else entirely. But the lengths to which they've been willing to go to silence everyone who has any knowledge of their plot suggests that something more serious is afoot here. Percival was quiet a moment, his gaze, like Sebastian's, following the troop of men as they wheeled to their right. A man in my position makes enemies, he said at last. It's inevitable. You saw that poor old sod Bellingham. Bellingham is an annoying gnat compared to these men. They're ruthless and brutal. Percival scrubbed one hand across the lower part of his face. If they killed those eight women, and that was only the beginning. The Prime Minister turned to face him. What would you have me do? Cower in Downing Street in fear? I can't do that and still properly run this country. Sebastian felt the cold wind buffet his face bringing him the smell of dust and damp grass. I don't know what I'm suggesting you do. Only be aware that someone wants you dead, and take whatever precautions you can. The bells of the abbey began to strike the hour. I must go, said Percival, turning toward Carlton House. I'm to meet with the Prince Regent at half-past. He gripped Sebastian's shoulder for a moment, then let him go. Thank you for the warning. Sebastian stood for a moment, watching the slim, middle-aged man hurry away. Then he turned toward his own waiting curricle. And it occurred to him as he crossed Whitehall that in the past hour he'd said essentially the same thing to three very different people. Hannah Green, Miss Jarvis, and Spencer Percival. He had the disquieting feeling that time was running out for all three. I can take it to my mum, no worries, said Calhoun, when Sebastian returned to Brook Street for a quick consultation with his valet. To the blue anchor. Calhoun shook his head. Grace spends most of her time these days at the Red Lion. Good Lord, said Sebastian. If anything, the Red Lion had an even more shocking reputation than the blue anchor, but he couldn't see how he had any choice. I'll order the town carriage for you. Hannah Green caught her breath in shivering delight when she saw the carriage pull up before the door. Cool, she whispered. It's like something out of a fairy tale it is. As good as a ride in the curricle? Sebastian asked, giving her a hand up the steps. Better. He cast a glance at Jules Calhoun. Think your mother can handle her? The valet laughed and hopped up behind her. My mum? Are you serious? 
You ain't coming with us, said Hannah. Sebastian shook his head and took a step back. He'd realized it was past time he paid another visit to the Orchard Street Academy. Chapter 50 Leaving Tom and the Curricle at Portman Square, Sebastian walked the length of Orchard Street, the weight of a double-barreled pistol heavy against his side. It was early yet, the footpath crowded with last-minute shoppers. As he approached the once grand old house, he pulled his hat low over his eyes and turned up the collar of his driving coat. If anyone could identify the men who'd hired Rose, Hesse, and Hannah off the floor last Tuesday and return the next night to kill them, it was the abbess of the Orchard Street Academy, Miss Lill. The problem was going to be getting past the broken-nosed pugilist who guarded the brothel's door to talk to her. The oil lamp mounted high on the Academy's front had already been lit against the gathering gloom, a flame flickering in the evening breeze to throw patterns of light and shadow across the house's stone facade. Sebastian mounted the shallow brown steps, his hand on the flintlock in his pocket, as he prepared to either bluff or bully his way inside. But at the top of the steps he hesitated. The door stood unlatched and slightly ajar. His hand tightening around the handle of the pistol, Sebastian drew it from his pocket, every sense coming to tingling alertness. Drawing back the flintlock's first hammer, he used his shoulder to nudge the door open, wider. The familiar tang of freshly spilled blood hit him first, overlaying the scents of candle wax and dry rot and decadence. The hall looked much as he remembered it, the once grand carpet and soaring plasterwork illuminated by bronze sconces with mottled mirrors. The dim golden light showed him the doorman, Thackeray, half sitting, half lying in a huddled heap against the wall just inside the entrance. Stepping cautiously into the hall, Sebastian gave the man a nudge with the toe of one boot, which sent the pugilist flopping sideways in a heavy, slow-motion roll. His eyes were closed, his plump cheeks as soft and flushed as a sleeping babe's. His pistol held at the alert. Sebastian reached down with his left hand and felt the man's still warm neck for a pulse. Then his gaze fell to the dark stain of blood visible beneath the edge of the man's coat. Flipping back the brown corduroy, Sebastian studied the neatly sliced waistcoat. It was the kind of cut left by a dagger, aimed well and deep. He straightened, aware of the unnatural quiet of the house around him. He threw a quick glance into the small room to his right, but found it, mercifully, empty. He moved on, his heart pounding in his chest. How many women would a house like this one employ, he wondered. Two dozen? More? Add to that their customers. He paused at the heavy velvet curtain of the arch the polished grip of the pistol slick with sweat in his hand. At his feet lay a stout man of perhaps fifty, with heavy jowls and graying dark hair. A customer by the looks of him, at the wrong place, at the wrong time. He sprawled on his back, his arms flung wide like a crucifixion victim. Moving cautiously, Sebastian stepped past him, into the parlour, with its fading emerald hangings, the tawdry splendor of mouldering mirrors grand enough to have graced the halls of Versailles in an earlier, less decadent life. The light from the branches of candles on the chipped marble mantelpiece flared up warm and golden, showing him two more dead women. The Cyprian lying near the settee was unknown to him. Turning her over, he found himself staring into wide, vacant blue eyes. Her hair was the color of corn silk her teeth as small and white as a child's. A spill of blood trickled from the corner of her open mouth to pool on the carpet like a misshapen black rose. Beyond her, near the base of the staircase, he found Miss Lil. Sebastian crouched down beside the Academy's abbess. She lay curled on one side, her hands thrust out as if she'd sought to fend off her assailant. He touched her cheek and watched her head loll unnaturally against her shoulder. He didn't need Paul Gibson to diagnose the cause of death. Four dead. 
Sitting back on his heels, Sebastian lifted his gaze toward the first floor above. Surely one of them had cried out in alarm or terror before they died? Had no one upstairs heard? All the inhabitants of this house so accustomed to the sound of screams and shouts that no one had paid any heed? Pushing to his feet, he was about to mount the steps when he became aware of another scent hanging in the air, mingling with the odour of blood and decay. The hot, pungent scent of a quickly extinguished candle. His gaze shifted to the lacy alcove to the right of the hearth. When he'd been here before, the alcove had been lit by a candle that had shown him the wraith-like silhouette of a woman and a harp. Now all was darkness and silence. He crossed the room with rapid strides to snatch back the lace curtain. The alcove smelled of hot wax and charred candle wick and raw fear. The harp stood abandoned in the centre of the alcove, the low stool beside it overturned. Just inside the curtain, a tall, gaunt-faced woman pressed her back to the wall, her hands splayed out beside her as if she could will herself to disappear into the panelling. I'm not going to hurt you he said gently. You're safe. The woman's thin chest jerked with her ragged breathing. God have mercy on me, she whispered, her voice cracking. They're dead, aren't they? All dead. Sebastian studied her pale face, the straight brown brows and sharply edged bones so obvious beneath the inadequate flesh of cheek and forehead. She looked to be in her late twenties or early thirties. Her speech was cultured, her gown rigorously high-necked and modest, and judging by the milky-white glaze that obscured her eyes, she was quite blind. He said, How long ago did this happen? A minute, maybe two, not long. Sebastian's gaze lifted to the stairs. He had walked the length of Orchard Street, the academy always in his line of sight. If anyone had left the house a minute or two before his arrival, he'd have seen them. He felt his body tense. Where did they go? The men who did this, I mean. Upstairs. Even as he asked the question, he had a thump from overhead, followed by a woman's high-pitched laugh and the lower tones of a man's voice. No, said the harpist, her spine still pressed flat to the wall. Down the hall, toward the back of the house. His gaze shifted to the darkened hall that ran along the back of the stairs. What's there? The kitchen, she said. Her head lifted suddenly, her face turning as a more pungent scent of smoke overrode the lingering wisps from the candles. Do you smell that? He smelled it. He could hear it, too, the crackling of flames, the roar of ancient timbers catching, flaring up. Bloody hell, he swore, grabbing her wrist. They've torched the place. Come on! Jerking her from the alcove, he raised his voice to shout, Fire! Everyone out, quickly! Fire! No, oh, she said, squirming from his grasp to dart back behind the curtain. My harp! Bloody hell, he said again, as she struggled beneath the instrument's weight. I'll bring the bloody harp. Already he could see the faint reddish glow from the rear of the house, hear the screams of the women, the excited shouts of the men, the thump of running feet on the stairs. Just get out of here! She refused to leave without him, or more accurately, without her harp. Be careful, she cautioned, as he staggered beneath its bulk. Squealing, half-naked women and men with bare pink flesh that glowed in the lamplight pushed past them in a scrambling rush for the door. A middle-aged man with a hairy, sunken white chest and flaxid phallus kept bleating, I say, I say, I say. The clanging of the firebell reverberated up and down the street. Already a crowd was forming at the base of the house's front steps. Buckets appeared, passed hand to hand. Swearing softly beneath his load, Sebastian pushed their way through the shouting throng and turned toward Portman Square. There's just one thing I don't understand, Miss... Driscoll, she said, hovering protectively about her harp as the crush of men, women and children rushing toward the fire increased. Mary Driscoll. Miss Driscoll. The sounding board of the harp was beginning to dig unpleasantly into his back. Why didn't those men kill you? They didn't know I was there. 
I put out my candle and quit playing the instant I heard them in the hall with Thackeray. You know who they were? No, but I recognize their voices. They came to the house the night Hesse Abrahams died. Sebastian studied her gaunt, strained features. You recognize their voices? How many times have you heard them? Only the once. She must have caught the doubt in his own voice, because an unexpected smile curled her lips. When you're blind, you learn to listen very, very carefully. He could see his curricle now, Tom at the chestnut's heads trying to quiet them as they sidled nervously, their manes tossing, nostrils flaring at the scent of the fire. Sebastian said, Tell me about the men. How many were there? Only two, she said. The one was older, in his thirties, I'd say. He was the one in charge. The younger man listened to him, did what he was told without question or argument. Like a good soldier, thought Sebastian. Aloud, he said, what about their accents? She shook her head. Couldn't tell much, beyond the fact that they were gentlemen. He put out his hand, stopping her when she would have kept walking. We're at my carriage. Clavna, said Tom, his mouth falling open. You ain't never going to fit that thing in the curricle. Yes, I am, said Sebastian, temporarily setting the harp on the flagstones beside the carriage. Miss Driscoll here is going to hold it on her lap. He offered her a hand up, and she took it without hesitation. With the academy in flames, he supposed she had no place else to go. But as he watched her settle on the curricle's high seat, Another thought occurred to him. He said, Do you know who I am? Again, that faint smile. Of course I know who you are. You're Viscount Devlin. You came to the house last Tuesday. You had wine with Miss Lil, Tasmin, Becky, and Sarah. Then your questions made Miss Lil uncomfortable, and she asked you to leave. I never gave my name. No, but I heard Miss Lil and Mr. Kane talking about you later. People are strange in that way. If you can't see, they often act as if you can't hear either. Or perhaps they simply assume I'm stupid. She was far from stupid. He handed the harp up to her, grunting softly beneath its weight. That still doesn't explain why you're willing to come with me. She clutched the harp to her. Those men were looking for Miss Lil. Once they'd killed her, they left. He saw her delicate throat work as she swallowed. I don't want them to come for me. Sebastian gazed up at her thin, plain face. Now that he had her in his curricle, he wasn't exactly sure what he was going to do with her. From the distance came a shout, followed by what sounded like a collective sigh, as the walls of the academy collapsed inward in a fiery inferno that sent sparks flying high into the night sky. Governor, said Tom. Sebastian leapt up into the curricle and gathered the reins. Stand away from their heads, he said, and turned the chestnuts toward Covent Garden Theatre. Chapter 51 Cat Boleyn might have been the most celebrated young actress of the London stage, but her cramped dressing room at the Covent Garden Theatre was not designed to accommodate Miss Boleyn in full costume as Beatrice, a tall nobleman in a many-caped driving coat, and a blind woman clutching a harp. She looked at Mary Driscoll's pale, strained face and said to Sebastian, Could I speak to you outside for a moment? They crowded into a dimly lit corridor smelling strongly of grease paint and orange peels and dust. Cat whispered, Sebastian, what are you going to do with her? I'm hoping she can identify the men who forced their way into the academy tonight. She's blind. Yes, but she heard their voices. She'll be able to recognize them if she hears them again. Cat looked at him. He knew what she was thinking, that while he might credit Miss Driscoll's ability to identify voices, no one else would. But all she said was, and afterward. What will you do with her then? Don't worry, I won't leave you lumbered with her forever. I'm not worried about that. I'm sorry, 
but I had no place else to take her where I knew she'd be safe. He couldn't see taking a woman like Mary Duskall to the Red Lion. Sebastian, truly, it's all right. She reached out to touch his arm. A simple enough gesture, yet it sent a rush of forbidden longing coursing through him. It had been a mistake to come here, he realized. A mistake to allow himself to stand this close to her. To breathe in all the old familiar scents of a tainted past. She dropped her hand and took a step back. I heard someone has tried to kill you. Twice. Where did you hear that? She stood with her arms gripped across the stomach of her costume as if she were cold, although it was not cold in the theater. Instead of answering, she said, You will be careful, not just of this killer, but of Jarvis. I can handle Jarvis. No one can handle Jarvis. To his surprise, Sebastian found himself smiling. His daughter can. Walking out of the theatre a few minutes later, Sebastian found his tiger waiting patiently at the chestnut's heads. The night had fallen clear and cold, with just the hint of a breeze that carried with it the sound of music and laughter and men's voices raised in a toast. Sebastian said, Take them home, Tom. I won't be needing you any more tonight. The tiger glanced at the door of the nearby music hall, then back at Sebastian's face. I can stay. Sebastian's gaze lifted, like Tom's, to the music hall door. It was too well lit, too loud, too full of the exuberance of life. Sebastian intended to do his drinking someplace dark and earnest. He clapped the tiger on the shoulder and turned away. Just go home, Tom. Now. Chapter 52 Sunday, 10th of May, 1812 My lord! My lord! Sebastian opened one eye, tried to focus on the lean, serious face of his valet, then gave it up with a groan. I don't care if the entire city of London is afire. Just go away. Here, said Calhoun slipping what felt like a warm mug into Sebastian's slack hand. Drink this. What the devil is it? Tincture of milk thistle. Sebastian opened the other eye, but it didn't work any better than the first. What the hell are you doing here? Go away. A message has arrived from Dr. Gibson. And? Sebastian opened both eyes this time and clenched his teeth as the room spun unpleasantly around him. It seems the authorities have recovered the body of a military gentleman by the name of Max Ludlow. Dr. Gibson will be performing the autopsy this morning, and he thought you might be interested. Sebastian sat up so fast the hot liquid in the forgotten mug sloshed over the sides and burned his hand. Bloody hell! Drink it, my lord, said Calhoun, turning away toward the dressing room. Nothing is better than milk thistle when you've got the devil of a head. The milk thistle helped some, but not enough to encourage Sebastian to do more than glance at the dishes awaiting him in the breakfast room, before turning away and calling for his town carriage. The day had dawned cool, but clear, and far too bright. He subsided into one corner of his carriage and closed his eyes. Gibson's autopsies were never pleasant but Sebastian didn't want to even think about the kind of shape Max Ludlow's body would be in after ten days. He's in the room out the back, said Gibson's housekeeper when she opened the door to Sebastian. A short, stout woman with iron-gray hair and a plain, ruddy face, she scowled at him with unabashed disapproval. I'm to take you there. Not that I'm going any farther than halfway down the garden, mind you. It's unnatural what he does down there. Sebastian followed Mrs. Federico's broad back down the ancient narrow hall and through the kitchen to the untidy yard that led to the small stone building where Gibson performed both his post-mortems and his illicit dissections. True to her word, halfway across the yard, Mrs. Federico drew up short. Viscount or no Viscount, I ain't going no farther, she said. 
and headed back toward her kitchen. Sebastian had to quell the urge to follow her. He could already smell Max Ludlow. There you are, said Gibson, appearing at the building's open doorway, his gore-stained hands held aloft. I thought you'd be interested in this. Sebastian tried breathing through his mouth. Where did they find him? In Bathnell Green, wrapped in canvas and dumped in a ditch along Jew's Walk. I suppose it's better than the Thames, said Sebastian. He'd seen bodies pulled out of the river after a week. It wasn't a sight he cared to see again. There was water in the ditch. Good God, said Sebastian. He should have had more of Calhoun's milk thistle. Gibson ducked back into the building's dank interior. After a brief hesitation, Sebastian followed. Naked and half eviscerated, the body on the room's stone slab looked like something out of his worst nightmares. One glance at the bloated waxy flesh and its resident insect population was enough. Sebastian stared at the ceiling. Are they sure that's Max Ludlow? Sebastian asked when he was able. Someone from the regiment identified him. In another day, it probably would have been impossible. Parts of the body were already virtually reduced to bones, but thanks to the way he was lying, the face is actually fairly well preserved. Sebastian held his handkerchief to his nose and resisted the impulse to take another look. Any idea how he died? As a matter of fact, yes. Gibson turned around to reach for a tin basin. I found this in his heart. Sebastian stared down at a bloody pair of strange, broken blades, handleless and oddly shaped. What are they? It's a broken pair of sewing scissors, said Gibson, setting the bowl aside so that he could demonstrate an upthrusting, twisting motion. Whoever killed him must have stabbed him with the scissors, then broken them off when they hit a rib. So he was killed by a woman, said Sebastian. Not necessarily, but more than likely. Did Hannah Green ever mention how Rachel Fairchild killed the man in her room? Sebastian shook his head. She may not have known. He went to stand in the yard just outside the door to try to breathe. It didn't help. Wiping his hands on a stained cloth, Gibson came out with him. I heard about the fire at the academy last night. That makes four more dead. He brought up one splayed hand to rub his temples. I thought I'd left carnage on this scale behind when I got out of the army. Sebastian jerked his head toward the dark, foul room behind them. That body on your slab was once a hussar captain, remember? Gibson's hand slipped back to his side, his eyes widening. What are you saying? That you think these killers are military men? It's what war teaches us, isn't it? Not just to kill, but to kill on a grand scale. There's a difference between killing enemy soldiers on a battlefield and slaughtering unarmed English women in a London slum. You mean because one is sanctioned by authority and the other is not? Well, yes. In the silence that followed, the endless drone of buzzing flies sounded both abnormally loud and oppressively familiar. It was the sound of death. Sebastian said, Some men learn to like killing, or at least they learn not to shrink from it, and that can be just as dangerous. Gibson squinted up at the clouds beginning to gather on the horizon, his face grim. Sebastian knew what he was remembering, the images that haunted both men's dreams. The Portuguese peasants shot down in their fields along with their mules and their dogs. The Spanish families burned alive in their farmhouses. Gibson said, but for British soldiers, officers, to kill English women. He shook his head. I know that shouldn't make a difference. Yet to most people it does. It makes a difference because most people have a tendency to see anyone who speaks a different language or has a darker skin as somehow less human than themselves. But a lot of people see prostitutes as less than human, too. Their lives are considered cheap, expendable. If it hadn't been for Miss Jarvis, 
the eight women who died at the Magdalene House would already be forgotten. But why would Hussar officers want to kill the Prime Minister? I don't know, Sebastian admitted. Gibson jerked his head toward the dank room behind them. If it's true, if Max Ludlow was one of the three men Hannah Green was telling us about, then who were the other two? At this point, I'd put my money on Patrick Somerville being one of them. The Hussar captain from Northamptonshire? Do you think Hannah could identify him? She might not be able to remember names, but women in her line of work learn to recognize faces. Yet it won't be enough, will it? said Gibson. Even if Somerville was at the academy the night Rachel Fairchild and Hannah Green fled, there's still nothing to tie him to the Magdalen House killings. Or to last night's attack. No, but Miss Driscoll might be able to do so. Gibson looked confused. Miss Driscoll? Who is she? The academy's blind harp player. Gibson's frown deepened. If she's blind, how can she identify him? Sebastian thought about explaining, then gave it up. Never mind. Just lend me some paper and a pen, would you? Chapter 53 The difficult part, Sebastian realized, would be finding a surreptitious way for Miss Driscoll to hear Patrick Somerville speak. Much easier to first show Patrick Somerville to Hannah Green, he decided and see if she recognized him. Leaving Gibson's surgery near Tower Hill, Sebastian directed his coachman to Grace Calhoun's Red Lion Tavern in West Street. Lying just a few houses from Saffron Hill on the north side of one of the last uncovered stretches of Fleet Ditch, the Red Lion was well known as the resort of thieves and the lowest grade of the frail sisterhood. He found Grace in the tavern's back parlor, polishing pewter tankards. She was a tall woman, taller even than her son, and just as lean, with a face that was all sharp planes and interesting angles, accentuated rather than blurred by the passing of the years. At the sight of Sebastian, she turned the tankards over to a gnarled old man with a grey whiskered face and a wooden peg for a leg, and came out from behind the counter. She had bright, intelligent brown eyes, and hair the colour of storm clouds she wore neatly tucked beneath a fine lace cap. In her youth, she must have been striking. She was still handsome, and very, very astute. So, you're the fine lord my jewels has been telling me about, she said, looking Sebastian up and down without a smile. It was never my intention to see the boy set up as a gentleman's gentleman, you know. I hired that old fool of a valet to teach him how to talk and act and dress like a gentleman. Not to teach him to be a gentleman's gentleman. He is a very good valet. It's not what I intended. She wiped her hands on her apron. I suppose you're here to see that young trollop Jules asked me to mind. I hope Miss Green hasn't been causing you any trouble. Grace Calhoun gave a derisive snort. That one. She's a taking little thing, I'll grant you that. Which is lucky, seeing as how she ain't got the sense God give a fence post. She cast him another assessing glance, then turned back to her tankards. Last I saw her, she was in the yard. He found Hannah Green sitting cross-legged in a corner of the cobbled yard near the dilapidated stables, the fitful sun on her bowed bare head her arms full of three wriggling, squirming, black-and-white kittens. Do look, Lord Devlin, she said merrily when she saw him. Ain't they just the sweetest things you ever seen? I always wanted a kitten. She was still wearing the spangled pink-and-white striped gown, but without the rouge and the burgundy plumes, she looked even younger than before, no more than fifteen or sixteen at the most. Sebastian watched her laughingly peel one adventurous kitten off the top of her head, and it occurred to him that he was beginning to collect dependent females. He had no idea what he was going to do with either of them. If you can tear yourself away from the kittens, he said, I thought you might like to take another carriage ride. Hannah scrambled to her feet, her eyes going round. Honest? Ooh, 
Just let me get my bonnet. Sebastian rescued the tumbling kittens and barely had time to restore them to the mother cat, sunning herself atop a nearby mouldering bed of hay, before Hannah was back, the bedraggled plumed hat once more atop her auburn head, a reticule swinging from its fraying strings. Where are we going? she asked, as she trustingly allowed herself to be handed up into Sebastian's town carriage. He swung up to take the forward seat. You said you recognized the man who came to your rooms in the haymarket and strangled Tasman Pool? That he was one of the men who also hired you off the floor last week? Yes, she said, not sure where his questions were headed. He was the tight-lipped one who picked us up from the academy. Tight-lipped? asked Sebastian, diverted. Yeah, you know, he has those thin kind of lips he always keeps crimped together. She held out both hands, thumbs pressed tightly to index fingers in what he supposed was meant to be an imitation of the killer's mouth. But he was afraid a bug might fall in there when he weren't paying attention or something. It was more than she'd said before. And the man Rose Fletcher killed the next night, when the men came back. He was with the tight-lipped gentleman when he picked you up in the hackney. She nodded. She'd given up imitating the killer's mouth and had taken to gnawing a fingernail instead, her gaze on the crowded streets and shop windows flashing past outside the carriage. I'm interested in the third gentleman, said Sebastian. She craned her neck around to continue watching a hurdy-gurdy player with a monkey who stood on a street corner. You mean the birthday cove? That's right. The one who chose you when the men returned to the academy the next night. Would you recognize him if you saw him again? Hannah swung her head to look at him, her eyes huge in an uncharacteristically solemn face. I don't want to see him again. I don't want to see any of them again. But you would recognize him? Yes, said Hannah, around the fingernail in her mouth. That's where we're going now, to see if we can find him. She gave a startled laugh. Go on with you. I hear tell there's a million or more people in London. How are you going to find one cove in amongst a million people? There's a coffee house in Coxpur Street called the Scarlet Man, and most officers in town, either active duty or half pay, wander in there at one point or another on a Sunday afternoon. How'd you know they was military coves? He regarded her fixedly. You knew they were military? She'd never mentioned it. She twitched one shoulder. Yeah. What else do you know that you haven't told me? It came out more sharply than he'd intended. Her eyes narrowed. I didn't think it was important. The horses slowed. She shifted her gaze to the glazed front of the coffee shop that stood near Charing Cross. You reckon the birthday cove is in there now? The coachman drew the carriage in close to the opposite curb. If not, he'll be here eventually. Can you see the door of the coffee house from where you are? She shifted her weight restlessly, her lower lip creeping out in the beginnings of a pout. Why? Suppressing a smile, Sebastian drew from his pocket the note he had prepared and signaled one of the footmen. Find an urchin and give him a couple of shillings to deliver this to Captain... Patrick Somerville in The Scarlet Man. That's right clever, said Hannah, watching the footman turn away with the note. What's it say? Only that the captain is needed at his regiment. Her brows drew together under the strain of thought. You reckon this Somerville is the birthday cove? Does the name sound familiar? Hannah shrugged. I don't pay no attention to names. Her frown deepened as she watched the footman hail a half-grown lad. What if this Somerville ain't there? Then we wait. The lower lip came into play again. We should have brought the kittens. But in the end, they had no need to wait. A moment later, a tall, lean gentleman in the gold-frogged, dark blue tunic of a hussar appeared at the door of the coffee house and turned to walk briskly toward Whitehall. That's him, said Hannah shrinking back into the shadows of the carriage's interior. That's the birthday cove. You're certain? Of course I'm certain. I told you, I don't pay no attention to names, but I'll never forget a face.
Sebastian regarded her thoughtfully. She was not, despite all appearances to the contrary, quite as lacking in sense as a fence post. He said, You wouldn't happen to know how Rose Fletcher killed the man in her room that night, would you? She stabbed him, Hannah whispered, leaning forward as if someone could overhear. Stabbed him with a pair of sewing scissors. Leastways, that's what she said. She sat back again, the anxiety on her face fading as her thoughts turned to a more pleasant topic. Do you think Mrs. Calhoun would let me keep one of the kittens? Chapter 54 A slow drizzle fell that evening, glazing the paving stones and footpaths of Mayfair with a wet sheen that reflected the light of the wind-flickered street lamps and passing carriage lanterns. Dressed in knee breeches and a white silk waistcoat with buckled shoes at his feet and a chapeau bras tucked under one arm, Sebastian set forth for the ball being given that evening by Lady Burnham in her Park Lane home. The rain had thinned the crowds gathered on the footpath outside to watch, but it still took Sebastian's carriage an inordinate amount of time to press its way forward, for some five hundred people had been invited to the ball. He had no doubt that Patrick Somerville's well-married sister, Lady Berridge, would be in attendance, with her reluctant brother in tow. As he entered the ballroom, the first person he saw was his aunt Henrietta, who immediately gasped and groped for the quizzing glass she always wore around her neck, even when decked out in mauve silk and lace and a towering turban. Good heavens, Devlin! What are you doing here? First Almax and Lady Melbourne's breakfast? Now Lady Burnham's ball? She drew in a deep breath that swelled her massive bosom and gave him an arch smile. Don't tell me you've finally taken it into your head to look for a wife. No, he said baldly, his gaze raking the crowded ballroom beyond her. In actual fact, he was looking for a murderer, but he wasn't about to tell his aunt that. His eyes narrowed as he spied Patrick Somerville talking to a pale-haired young matron near the bank of French doors that overlooked the rear terrace. If I change my mind, believe me, aunt, you'll be the first to know. Excusing himself, he pushed on through the laughing, chattering crowd. But as ill luck would have it, he had only worked his way around half of the room when he came upon Miss Jarvis. Good heavens, she said in a tone that exactly matched his aunt's, except that Miss Jarvis was not smiling. What are you doing here? I received an invitation. Yes, but you never attend these things. She was wearing an emerald green silk gown that became her surprisingly well, and had crimped her hair so that it softened the angular planes of her face. But there was nothing soft about her expression. She frowned. You're looking for someone, aren't you? Who is it? He deliberately turned his back on the row of French doors. Perhaps I've suddenly taken it into my head to enjoy a bit of dancing. Nonsense. She cast a quick glance around. We can't talk here. Escort me to the refreshment room. He was too much of a gentleman to refuse her, and she knew it. Lending her his arm, he led her through the crush to a chamber that had been set aside for refreshments. He was hoping to find it crowded. It was nearly deserted. I want you to tell me what happened last night in Orchard Street, she said, accepting a glass of lemonade. You do know, don't you? She would have read about the fire in that morning's papers, of course. He picked up a plate and surveyed the delicate tidbits offered by their hostess to sustain her guests until supper. I think the abbess was the intended target, he said, as calmly as if they were discussing the orchestra or the silver streamers decorating the ballroom. Do you like shrimp or crab? Shrimp, please. He didn't expect her to know what an abbess was, but in that, he reckoned without the research that had embroiled her in this murderous tangle to begin with. She said, They killed her? Yes. He selected three fat shrimp, then added a slice of ham and some melon, along with a fair number of others. Because they thought she could identify them, is that it? If she could, it's a wonder they let her live so long. I suspect she didn't know their names. She only became a threat as we began to circle around toward them. He let his gaze wander over the table. Would you like an ice? 
No, thank you. She took the plate he'd prepared for her. Do you think they'll go after Hannah Green again? They would if they knew where to find her. Fortunately, they don't. She applied herself to the refreshments with a healthy appetite. How is she, by the way? Hannah. Last time I saw her, she was in rapture over the stable cat's litter of black and white kittens. Miss Jarvis glanced up, half frowning and half laughing, as if uncertain whether to believe him or not. Kittens? Kittens. He studied her clear gray eyes, the delicate curve of her cheek. He considered telling her about the harp player and about Patrick Somerville, then changed his mind. The less he involved her in all this, the better. She said, what will become of her when this is over? Hannah? He shook his head. I'm not certain. In many ways, she's still a child. But not in all ways. He knew she regretted her words the instant she said them. For one frozen moment, their gazes met and held. She set her plate aside. Thank you for the refreshments, she said, and turned on her heel and left him there, looking after her. By the time Sebastian made his way back to the ballroom, Patrick Somerville had disappeared. Sebastian prowled the conservatory and the rooms set aside for card playing, before finally wandering out onto the terrace to find the hussar captain leaning against the stone balustrade and smoking a cheroot. Nasty habit I picked up in the Americas, said Somerville, blowing a cloud of blue smoke out of his lungs. My sister Mary keeps telling me it'll be the death of me but I tell her the malaria'll kill me long before then. Sebastian came to stand beside him and look out over the glistening wet garden. The rain had eased up, but the air was still chill and damp, and smelled strongly of wet earth and wet stone. I hear they've found your friend's body. Somerville drew on his cheroot, his eyes narrowing. Yes, poor old sod. I understand he had a pair of sewing scissors broken off in his heart. The hussar turned his head to stare directly at Sebastian. Where did you hear that? From the surgeon who performed the post-mortem. Sebastian kept his gaze on the garden. A man killed at the Orchard Street Academy last week was stabbed by a pair of sewing scissors. Somerville drew on his cheroot and said nothing. Sebastian said, how many bodies do you think have turned up in London in the past year with pairs of sewing scissors broken off in their hearts? The captain tossed the stub of his cheroot into the wet garden below, then pursed his lips, expelling a long stream of fragrant smoke. You know I was there too, don't you? Yes. Somerville flattened his hands on the wet balustrade, his back hunched as he stared out over the shadowy gardens. I still don't understand what happened that night. First, the girl I was with disappeared. And then, when I went looking for Ludlow, they said he'd already gone. You believed them? Why wouldn't I? We were supposed to meet up later at a tavern near Soho. I went there expecting to find him waiting for me, but he never showed up. At first, I thought he'd simply changed his mind and gone home. It wasn't until he was still missing the next day that I realized something had gone wrong. I thought he'd been jumped by footpads or something. I never imagined he hadn't even left the academy. Who else was with you that night? No one. He pushed away from the balustrade. What's your interest in this, anyway? From the ballroom behind them came the lilting chorus of an English country dance. Sebastian said, I'm just doing a favor for an acquaintance. He studied the man's pale face clammy with sweat, despite the chill from the rain. By the way, I've been meaning to ask, when's your birthday? My birthday? Somerville gave a shaky laugh. Why do you ask? It was last week, was it? A muscle jumped along the man's tightened jaw as he considered his answer. Yes, he said slowly, realizing the futility of denying it. Why? Happy birthday. Sebastian said, and walked off into the night. Unfortunately, you've no real proof, said Sir Henry Lovejoy. They were seated beside the cold hearth in the magistrate's simple parlour on Russell Square. A fire would have helped take the chill off the damp night, 
that Lovejoy never allowed a fire to be kindled in his house outside the kitchen after the 1st of April. Sebastian knew that for Lovejoy, it wasn't a matter of frugality, so much as a question of moral fibre. Sebastian poured himself another cup of hot tea and said, Hannah Green identified Patrick Somerville. As a customer, there's no law against paying a woman for a moment's physical gratification, however morally repugnant it might be. She didn't see him kill anyone. And even if she had, who'd take the word of a soiled dub against that of a hussar captain wounded in the defence of his country? He wasn't wounded. He has malaria. I think I'd rather be wounded. Frankly, so would I. Sebastian took a sip of his tea and wished it was something stronger. There's still the harp player. She heard the men who attacked the academy last night. If Somerville was one of them, and I strongly suspect he was, she would recognize his voice. If we can set up a situation in which she can hear him, no jury would convict a hussar captain on the strength of testimony given by a blind woman who played the harp in a brothel. Sebastian knew a welling of frustration. Lovejoy was right, of course. But there had to be a way. The girl who worked in the cheesemonger's shop across from the Magdalen house might recognize him. She noticed several gentlemen loitering in the street right before the fire. Did she actually see them go into the house? No. Lovejoy thrust out his short legs and crossed them at the ankles. It's just all too convoluted and confused. Even I still don't understand it properly. Sebastian leaned forward his elbows braced on his knees. A week ago last Tuesday, two men, Max Ludlow and another gentleman I've yet to identify, hired Rose Fletcher, Hannah Green and Hesse Abrahams off the floor of the academy as part of a birthday surprise for one of their friends, Captain Patrick Somerville. The women were taken by Hackney to room someplace where Somerville later joined them. It must have been decidedly awkward when he realized one of the women his friends had hired for the night was Rachel Fairchild, the sister of his childhood playmate. Lovejoy cleared his throat uncomfortably. Decidedly awkward, I should think. So awkward that I get the impression neither one of them let on about it. But Somerville must have said something to his friends the next day. And when it came out that Rachel's mother was French, that Rachel herself spoke French, they realized they'd been indiscreet, that she had overheard and understood. A dangerous conversation the men had conducted in French, assuming none of the women could understand them. So they went back to the academy the next night, planning to kill the women, before they could tell anyone what they'd heard. Yes, except, of course, it all went awry. The mysterious third gentleman made his kill quickly breaking Hesse Abraham's neck, but Rachel Fairchild managed to stab Max Ludlow with a pair of sewing scissors and then warn Hannah Green. I gather the three men were supposed to meet up at a tavern later. When Ludlow didn't show up, the others had no way of knowing what had gone wrong. It must have taken them several days to figure it out and to trace the two surviving women to the Magdalen house. By which time Hannah Green had already fled. Lovejoy stared thoughtfully at the cold, blackened recesses of the hearth. They killed an extraordinary number of people simply to silence one woman. They're soldiers. They're trained to kill. And they're on a mission. To kill the Prime Minister. Lovejoy stirred his tea, his features pinched and troubled. You've told Percival of your theory? That someone is planning to assassinate him? Yes. And? Sebastian smiled. He didn't believe me any more than you do. Lovejoy laid aside his spoon with a soft clatter. It just seems so absurd. No British Prime Minister has ever been assassinated. And by three of His Majesty's own officers? What possible motive could they have for doing such a thing? Sebastian shook his head. I don't know. What can you tell me about the man found this morning, Max Ludlow? Nothing to his discredit. He's described as a model officer. Loyal, brave, efficient. Which regiment? The 20th Hussars. The same as Somerville, thought Sebastian. Aloud, he said, where did he serve? Italy, Jamaica, Egypt, the Sudan, just about everywhere. He even had a hand in the capture of Cape Town from the Dutch.
Then he was sent to Argentina. That's right. Sebastian stared down at the dregs of his teacup. It had been nearly five years since the disastrous Argentinian campaign, when Britain had tried to wrest Spain's wealthy South American colony for its own. The expedition had been ill-conceived and undermanned. Thousands of men from England, Scotland, and Ireland had left their bones in the Rio de la Plata, while many of the survivors returned home ruined and bitter. You've no idea who this third man is, said Lovejoy. Sebastian set aside his empty cup and pushed to his feet. No, if I could find out who Ludlow and Somerville's associates are, who they served with in the past, it might tell me something. Lovejoy nodded. I'll set one of the constables to look into it. You'll... Sebastian broke off as comprehension dawned. So you've done it, have you? You've decided to accept the position at Bow Street? Sir Henry permitted himself a small, proud smile. It's not official until tomorrow morning, of course. But, yes. Congratulations. Sir Henry's smile widened, then slowly began to dim. Chapter 55 Monday, 11th of May, 1812 Hero slept poorly that night, long after the house had settled down around her, and the last of the carriages had rattled past in the street below. She lay awake, staring at the satin folds in the hangings above her bed. She'd thought, once, that if she could only discover who killed the women of the Magdalene house and why, then she'd understand how Rachel Fairchild had come to be there, how the granddaughter of a duke could ever have fallen so low as to make the sordid life of a woman of the streets her own. Once or twice, Hero had the niggling suspicion that Devlin knew more than he was letting on, but she couldn't begin to comprehend why he was refusing to tell her. Hero herself felt no closer today to understand the riddle of Rachel's life than she'd been a week ago, and she knew a growing sense of frustration, a fear that she was never going to know, never going to understand. Sometime before dawn, she heard the rain begin again, pattering against the window panes. She thought of Rachel Fairchild lying in her cold, lonely grave beneath the pounding rain, and although she knew it was absurd, the rain unsettled her. When she finally drifted off to sleep, it was with the vague, half-formed intention of visiting the friend's burial ground the next day. She arose early that morning, little refreshed. The rain had stopped some time after dawn, although the clouds still hung low and heavy. Armed with a selection of lilacs and lilies from the corner flower stall, Hero set forth shortly after breakfast, accompanied by her maid and travelling in her own carriage. She was aware of her father's servant discreetly shadowing her, but she had no need today to escape his watchful eye. He followed her north, past Oxford Road to Paddington, and the small hamlet of Pentonville that lay beyond it. She located the friend's meeting house and burial grounds easily enough, for she had sought directions from Joshua Walden. Leaving her carriage beneath the arching canopy of an old elm growing at the side of the road, she entered the burial ground through a simple gate in its low rubble wall. The graves of the eight women were easy to find. A sad row of freshly turned earth beside the far western wall, slashes of dark brown contrasting starkly with the green of the wet grass. As Hero walked down the hill, her gaze narrowed at the sight of a tall woman who stood beside the graves with her head bowed, her shoulders hunched. She was dressed in black silk, with her hands fisted around the strings of a large travelling reticule. At the sound of Hero's footfalls on the sodden grass, the woman turned, revealing the grief-ravaged face of Rachel's sister, Lady Sewell. It's you, she said in a breathy whisper, one hand coming up to cover her trembling mouth. Hero's step faltered. I'm sorry, I didn't know you were here. She made a vague gesture with the flowers she'd brought. I'll just leave these and go. Lady Sewell nodded toward the row of unmarked graves. I don't even know which of these graves is hers. Do you? Hero shook her head. No. 
I'm sorry. Lady Sewell's breath caught on a sob. She never told me what he was doing to her. You do believe me, don't you? Yes, of course, said Hero, although she hadn't the slightest idea what the woman was talking about. All those years, and she never said a word. But I should have known, shouldn't I? You should? Lady Sewell clenched her jaw tight to keep it from shuddering. We made a deal, father and I. I would keep quiet about the shooting, and he in turn would let me marry Sewell. Her lip curled. I should have known I couldn't trust him. The shooting, said Hero. A muscle bunched along the woman's jaw. He killed her, you know. My mother. It was an accident. He was trying to take the gun away from her and it went off. But he still killed her. Hero remembered what Devlin had told her about the death of Rachel's mother. You mean, in the pavilion? Rachel's sister nodded. Mama found out what he was doing to me. She knew he was spending the afternoon by the lake working on some speech he was to give. She went down there, intending to kill him. I ran after her, begging her not to do it. She just told me to go home. Hero studied the other woman's mottled, tear-streaked face. Your mother was planning to shoot your father? But why? Lady Sewell gave a soft, scornful laugh. You still don't understand, do you? You have no idea what it is like, lying in bed at night, afraid, listening for the creak of the stairs, your stomach clenching with the dread of hearing his footsteps in the hall, knowing what's coming, the pain, the... Her lip curled. The shame. Surely she didn't mean... Comprehension warred with incredulity and Hero's own ignorance. Did fathers do that to their own daughters? A wry smile curled the other woman's lips, and Hero realized something of her horror and disbelief must have shown on her face. See, said Rachel's sister, you don't believe it. After he killed Mama, I told him I was going to let everyone know what he did to me at night, what he'd been doing to me for years. He just laughed at me. He said no one would believe me. They'd think I made it all up. Hero hunched her shoulders as a damp wind blowing off the surrounding fields buffeted her. It wasn't cold, but she still shivered. So we struck a bargain, he and I. He promised, if I left, he wouldn't start doing to Rachel what he'd done to me all those years. But now that I look back on it, I realize. She drew in a ragged breath. He'd already started doing it to her, too. It's why she stopped singing. Why she buried her dolls. I thought it was because of Mama, but it wasn't. It was because of him. Hero stared at the woman's tall, elegant frame and pale features, not knowing what to say. Lady Sewell turned away to stare out over the surrounding fields. I remember one morning, not long after Rachel's betrothal to Ramsay was announced. I came upon her in the garden. She was singing, and I thought she was happy because she was in love. Now I realize she was happy because she thought she was finally going to get away from him. Hero's voice came out in a broken, raspy croak. When she ran away, where did you think she'd gone? I thought she'd gone to Ramsay, secretly, to get away from father. I just... She broke off, swallowed, and began again. I don't understand. Why didn't she come to me? Why didn't she tell me what he'd been doing to her? Perhaps she thought you wouldn't believe her, Hero said softly. Lady Sewell gave a strange laugh that raised the hairs on the back of Hero's neck. I went there to kill him, you know, this morning. Hero shook her head, not understanding. Kill whom? Father. I should have done it all those years ago. Yanking open her tapestry reticule, Lady Sewell drew forth a heavy carriage pistol. Hero stepped back, her gaze darting to the road where her father's watchdog lounged at his ease. I held the gun right in his face. But then I thought, if I shoot him, they'll hang me. And then, what will become of Alice? Alice? My little sister. He swears he's never touched her, but I don't believe him. Not this time.
Hero felt a cool gust of wind caress her cheek, breathed in the familiar scents of long, wet grass and damp earth, and felt so fundamentally altered by what she was hearing that she wondered if she'd ever quite right herself again. In the last two weeks, she'd been touched by violence on a shocking scale. She'd killed, and very nearly been killed herself. And then there was that other incident, the one she was endeavouring to forget. Yet this, this was somehow worse. She'd known about violence and death, and, vaguely, about what happened between a man and a woman. She hadn't known about this. How could any man be so depraved as to do such a thing to his own child? How could any child ever come to terms with such a monstrous betrayal? So we made another bargain, Lady Sewell was saying. Father and I, I let him live, and he will send Alice to live with me. She gave another of those wild laughs. He worries people will think it's strange. Can you imagine? The laughter suddenly died, leaving her expression pinched. I wish I could have killed him, she whispered. No, said Hero, reaching out to take the gun from Lady Sewell's hand. She expected the woman to resist, but she did not. No, your younger sister needs your comfort and support, and he's not worth hanging for. Yet if I'd killed him before, Rachel wouldn't be here. Hero stared down at the row of unmarked graves. Don't blame yourself. You can't be certain of that. You know it's true, said Rachel's sister. Hero's fist tightened around the gun in her hand. You can't blame yourself, she said again, even though she knew there was nothing she could say, nothing anyone could do that would ever take away the crushing burden of this woman's guilt. It was several hours later that a lad playing catch with his dog on Bethnal Green stumbled across the decomposing remains of another body. Is it a woman? asked Sir Henry Lovejoy, holding his folded handkerchief to his nose as he peered into the weed-filled ditch. Looks like it, sir, said one of the constables, standing ankle-deep in the murky water, his hat pulled low against the drizzle. What you want we should do with her? Take the body to the surgery of Paul Gibson near Tower Hill, said Lovejoy, his eyes watering from the stench. And you? He beckoned to the lad still hovering nearby with his dog. I've a crown for you if you'll take a message to Brook Street. Chapter 56 When Sebastian arrived at Tower Hill, Paul Gibson was downing a tankard of ale in his kitchen. The surgeon had stripped down to his breeches and shirt sleeves, and even from across the room Sebastian could smell the stench of rotting flesh that clung to him. Mrs. Federico was nowhere in sight. Is it Hesse Abrahams? Sebastian asked. Could be, said Gibson, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. She's the right age, but she's beyond identification, I'm afraid. Sebastian knew a spurt of disappointment. How did she die? Her neck's broken, but it's the way it's broken that's interesting. Come, I'll show you. Suppressing a groan, Sebastian followed the Irishman down to the end of the garden, through a swarm of buzzing flies, and into a room so thick with the reek of death it made his eyes water. Good God, said Sebastian, holding his handkerchief to his nose. How do you stand it? You get used to it, said Gibson, tying a stained apron over his clothes. After nearly two weeks, Hesse Abraham's body, if this was indeed Hesse Abraham's, was in an advanced stage of decomposition, the flesh blistered and suppurating and hideously discoloured. It took all of Sebastian's concentration to keep from losing what little he'd eaten of Madame Leclerc's delicate nuncheon. Do you know what happens when someone dies of a broken neck? Gibson asked, picking up a scalpel and what looked like a pair of pincers. Not exactly, you know. Standing at the corpse's throat, Gibson peeled back some of the decaying flesh to reveal the bone beneath. The top seven bones in your spine form your neck. Basically, they're part of your backbone, but they also serve to protect the spinal cord that runs through here. He broke off, pointing. 
you can break your neck and be all right as long as you don't damage your spinal cord. If you break the lower part of your neck and do injure the cord, you lose the use of your legs and maybe your arms too, depending on which vertebrae you break. Sebastian nodded. He'd seen a lot of men crippled by their injuries in the war. But if the neck breaks up here, said Gibson, indicating the first several bones, and the spinal cord is injured, then a person basically suffocates. They can't breathe. Sebastian took one look, then glanced away. How long does that take? About two to four minutes. Is that what happened to this woman? No. You see, there's another way to die from a broken neck. If the neck is twisted so sharply the spinal cord is torn in half, it affects your heart and the circulation of the blood. And you die. Almost instantly. You see it sometimes when a hanging goes well. Of course, they don't often go well. Sebastian forced himself to look again at the desiccated form on Gibson's dissection table. How was her neck broken? The spinal cord was snapped. The man I was treating after he stopped Miss Jarvis on the way back from Richmond had his neck snapped in exactly the same way. I didn't attach much importance to it at the time. But after I saw this, I got to thinking. So I spoke to the surgeon at St. Thomas's, who performed the post-mortem on Sir William Hadley. He was killed the same way. So was the Cyprian found in the Haymarket, Tasman Pool. Sebastian raised his gaze to his friend's face. This is significant. Why? It's not an easy thing to do, to break a neck like this. It requires training. We already suspected these men were military. Yes, but learning how to kill silently with a quick snapping of the neck isn't part of most officers' training. The thing is, said Gibson, laying aside his instruments, I've seen necks snapped like this before. Over the last three or four years, we've probably had a dozen or more cases. Sebastian studied his friend's tight, wadded face, not understanding at all. And? No one investigates those deaths, said Gibson. Some are common people, government clerks, French émigrés. But some are more prominent. You recall when Sir Humphrey Carmichael and Lord Stanton were found dead last autumn? Their necks were broken, just like this. The realization of what Gibson was saying spread through Sebastian like a strange, numbing sensation. Sir Humphrey Carmichael and Lord Stanton, along with an East India Company man named Atkinson, had all died for the same reason. And Felix Atkinson, he was killed the same way? Yes. Sebastian walked out of the dank, foul-smelling building into the sunlit garden. Last night's rain had cleansed the dust from the air, leaving the sky scrubbed so clean and blue it nearly hurt the eyes to look at it. It makes no sense, said Sebastian, aware of Gibson coming to stand beside him. I didn't think so, but then I thought maybe I was missing something. Sebastian shook his head. A hideous possibility dawned that all of this, the attack on the Magdalen house, Miss Jarvis's interest in solving the riddle of Rachel Fairchild's fall from grace and subsequent murder, even that poignant brush with death beneath the ancient gardens of Somerset House, had all been a part of some diabolical charade designed by Jarvis to draw him into what, and for what purpose. There was only one thing Sebastian did know. While their deaths had never been officially solved, the men Gibson had listed, Stanton, Carmichael, and Atkinson, had all been killed on the orders of the same man. Charles, Lord Jarvis. Chapter 57 Sebastian slapped open the door to Lord Jarvis's Carlton House antechamber and strode purposefully toward the inner sanctum. From behind the closed panel came the measured drone of the Baron's voice. Sir, a pathetically thin clerk with bushy eyebrows and a cadaver's pallor gasped and scrambled after him. Lord Jarvis is dealing with important affairs of state. You can't just go barging in there. Ignoring him, Sebastian thrust open the door to the inner chamber. As for the revenue, 
Lord Jarvis broke off, frowning as his head turned toward the door. He sat at his ease on a settee with crocodile-shaped feet and plump cushions covered in brown and turquoise striped silk. From a long table near the window overlooking the mall, a second clerk, occupied with the task of transcribing his lordship's words, looked up, his eyes widening in horror. Just what the bloody hell did you do? Sebastian demanded without preamble. Get your daughter to lure me into one of your diabolical plots so you could use me as a stalking horse. Jarvis cast a frozen stare first at one clerk, then the other. Leave us, both of you. Bowing his head, the man at the table scuttled away, his papers clutched to his chest, the first clerk at his heels. Jarvis leaned back against the silk cushions, his arms comfortably spread out along the settee's back, his big body relaxed. Far from being intimidated by Sebastian's angry, looming presence, the Baron looked vaguely amused. My daughter approached you on her own initiative, he said. If she employed some subterfuge to draw you into this investigation, it was not of my devising. Sebastian felt the heat of an old rage course through him, blending with the new. You expect me to believe that? When your henchmen have been killing everyone from Hesse Abrahams to Sir William Hadley? With deliberate slowness, Jarvis extracted an enameled snuffbox from his coat pocket and flipped it open. And who precisely is Hesse Abrahams? Don't your men even bother to tell you the names of the people they kill? Only if they're important. Sebastian resisted with difficulty the urge to smash his fist into the big man's fleshy, complacent face. What precisely were their orders? To kill everyone connected with this incident in any way? Rather than answer, Jarvis lifted a pinch of snuff to one nostril and sniffed. He looked utterly bored and uninterested, but Sebastian knew it was all for effect. What gives you the impression my men were responsible for the death of Sir William Hadley? The manner of Hadley's death, and Hesse Abrahams, and half a dozen others, is exactly the same as that employed to dispose of those individuals like Carmichael and Stanton, who have displeased you in the past. It's so unique, it's like a signature. There can't be many men in England who know how to kill instantly with a simple snapping of a neck. Jarvis closed his snuffbox with a soft click. He was no longer smiling. If you want me to believe this accusation, you need to tell me what you have discovered. Why? So your henchmen can kill anyone they've missed? Have they missed anyone? Sebastian thought of Hannah Green and the blind harp player from the academy, and realized the list was actually rather short. Jarvis pushed to his feet and went to stand at the window overlooking the moor. Watching him, Sebastian realized that his anger might have led him to misinterpret the situation. It was possible the plot to kill Percival was Jarvis's own, but that the big man remained ignorant of both his hireling's indiscretion on the night of Somerville's birthday celebration and their subsequent attempts to cover it up. Fixing his gaze on Jarvis's face, Sebastian provided the king's powerful cousin with a succinct version of the past two weeks' events, as he understood them. But Jarvis never gave anything away. In the end, he merely said calmly, Why would my henchman, as you call him, want to kill the prime minister? The use of the singular henchman, as opposed to henchmen, was not lost on Sebastian. There are far less spectacular ways of getting rid of Spencer Percival. Jarvis was saying, if that were indeed my wish, the prince is easily persuadable. One need only whisper in the royal ear. You could intend to use Percival's death to inflame public opinion, or as an excuse to move against an enemy. I could, agreed Jarvis, but I don't. The two men's gazes met, and for one fleeting moment, Jarvis's famed self-possession slipped. Sebastian saw swift comprehension mingled with horror, and the dawning of a fury so white-hot it swept away whatever lingering doubts Sebastian might still have had. And he knew in that instant that Jarvis would never forgive him for this, never forgive him for having been privy to the enormity of his failure.
What are you saying? That your man is acting on his own for reasons neither one of us understands? Sebastian gave a low laugh. That's rich. You think you know everything and control everything. Yet your agent has nearly killed your own daughter three times, and may yet succeed in assassinating the Prime Minister. Jarvis frowned. Three times? Too late, Sebastian recalled the Baron's ignorance of the third incident. He flattened his hands on the surface of the table between them and leaned forward. Tell me the man's name. Jarvis's fist clenched around his snuffbox so hard Sebastian heard the delicate metal crack. Epson Smith. Colonel Bryce Epson Smith. Chapter 58 The rooms occupied by Colonel Bryce Epson Smith were on the first floor of a genteel house just off Bedford Square. Sebastian arrived there shortly after four to find the former hussar colonel gone from home. A test conversation with the colonel's majordomo elicited the information that the colonel was spending the afternoon escorting the family of a Liverpudlian friend to the exhibition at the Royal Academy of Art. Turning south toward the river, Sebastian dropped his hands and let the chestnuts shoot forward. Even he's looking at pictures, at least he ain't killing the Prime Minister, said Tom, clamping his hat down tighter on his head and tightening his hold on his perch. Sebastian kept his attention on his horses, feathering the corner as he swung on to Drury Lane. He had a niggling sense that he was still missing something, a connection he should have seen, perhaps or an implication that continued to elude him. The Royal Academy of Art occupied rooms in the large neoclassical pile on the Thames that had replaced the Duke of Somerset's original palace. Pulling up on the strand, Sebastian tossed the reins to Tom and hit the footpath running. He sprinted toward the vestibule, heedless of the shocked expressions and muttered, and took the steep winding staircase two steps at a time. The Academy like all the other societies and governmental departments housed in the building, occupied a vertical slice of all six floors. To take advantage of the natural light provided by a skylight, the Academy had placed their exhibition room in the high-ceilinged, nearly square space at the very top of the stairs. Breathing hard, Sebastian burst into a chamber crowded with more than a thousand paintings, which climbed toward the ceiling in row after row, hung so closely together that their heavy gilt frames nearly touched. At the sound of his hurried footsteps crossing the polished floor, the small party gathered beneath the central lantern turned. Sebastian had a vague impression of two wan-faced women in plain round bonnets and unfashionably cut pelisses, one clutching the hand of a half-grown girl, and the other attempting to restrain a fidgety boy of perhaps eight. Beside them, Epson Smith cut a dashing figure in his military-style coat, shining top boots, and swooping side whiskers. His gaze fixed firmly on the former hussar officer, Sebastian walked up to the small group and executed a short bow. Ladies, if you'll excuse us, the colonel and I have something to discuss. The men's gazes met, clashed. This won't take but a moment, said Epson Smith to his companions. Some friends of one of my acquaintances from Liverpool, he told Sebastian as they moved away from the ladies. I thought it would make a nice outing. Sebastian kept his own tone low, conversational. Lord Jarvis might be a powerful protector, but he also makes a powerful enemy. I've no doubt he'd be willing to overlook the murder of any number of unimportant people but he's not at all pleased with your little plot to kill the Prime Minister. And as for your attempts on the life of his daughter, I'd say you've signed your own death warrant. The man's complacent arrogance never faltered. You've no proof tying me to any of this, he said, still faintly smiling. Not enough to convict you in a court of law, Sebastian conceded. But then, you'll never see the inside of a courtroom. The only thing that matters is what Jarvis believes. True. Only why should he believe you? You've threatened to kill him several times, whereas I have served him faithfully for nearly four years now. Faithfully? 
and efficiently, said Sebastian, dodging one of the pedestals topped with a particularly hideous set of bronzes that littered the exhibition room's floor. It's a distinctive way of killing. Just a quick snap of the neck. Where'd you learn it? A colonel's smile hardened. The Sudan. Through the glass of the skylight, Sebastian could see the afternoon clouds building overhead, bunching masses of angry black turmoil. The room grew perceptibly darker. What precisely is your argument with Percival? he asked. Epson Smith's lips pressed into a thin, tight line. Thanks to the incompetence of his government, my regiment went through hell in Argentina. We were promised compensation, but Percival deemed it an extravagant and unnecessary expense, and cancelled the arrangements. Thanks to his damnable interference, the ambitions of the few men who survived are being shattered, while the widows of those who died are ruined. You would kill him over that? Epson Smith pivoted to look back at the small party of women and children now clustered at the far end of the room. Not me, he said calmly. Percival has made many enemies. A man driven by passion can sometimes be goaded to act in ways not precisely in his own best interest, particularly when he's not in his right mind. Bellingham, said Sebastian remembering the half-mad Liverpudlian he and Percival had encountered on the footpath outside Armax. You know him? Then what a pity you've just missed him. He was here with us, you know, but he had to leave early. Some business to attend to, I believe, he said, at the House of Commons. Sebastian swung toward the steps, but Epson Smith put out a hand that closed on Sebastian's forearm in a surprisingly strong grip. You're too late, said the colonel. Sebastian lunged toward him, trying to break the man's hold on his arm. But in a maneuver Sebastian didn't see coming, the exercise spun Sebastian around, one arm clamping across Sebastian's chest to grip him by his right arm and draw him back into Epson Smith's deadly embrace. You kill me here, now, and you'll never get away with it, said Sebastian. The colonel's free hand came up to grasp Sebastian's chin in an unexpectedly iron hold. If Jarvis knows I tried to kill his daughter, I'm a dead man anyway. One quick twist, Sebastian realized, and his neck would snap. Bucking against the man's hold, Sebastian slammed his head back into Epson Smith's face, bone-crunching cartilage. With a startled grunt, Epson Smith loosened his grip on Sebastian just long enough for Sebastian to grasp the arm clamped across his chest and spin around, smashing the back of his fist into Epson Smith's bloody face. Still holding the man's arm, Sebastian twisted it in and down, forcing Epson Smith to pivot enough that Sebastian could stomp the heel of his right boot into the back of the man's left knee. Epson Smith went down on his knees, his left arm still held in Sebastian's grasp. Too late, Sebastian saw the flash of the blade that had appeared in the man's right hand. Slashing upward, he laid open Sebastian's forearm to the bone. Sebastian stumbled back, slipping in his own blood, bumping into one of the exhibition room's pedestals. Whirling, he caught up the bronze statue of a satire and hurled it. As Epson Smith ducked sideways, Sebastian yanked his own knife from his boot and charged. With a sweep of his forearm, Sebastian knocked the wrist of the hand holding the blade aside and drove his own dagger deep into Epson Smith's chest. He became aware suddenly of a woman screaming. A man's harsh shout, running footsteps. Yanking his knife free, sliding in the spreading pool of blood, Sebastian hurtled back down the steep winding stairs. Sprinting across the vestibule, he set up a call for his caracal. If only Tom hadn't gone far. Holy hell, Governor! Wide-eyed, Tom reined the chestnuts in hard before the vestibule's entrance. You're bleeding worse than a leaky bucket. Sebastian scrambled into the caracal. You drive, he said, yanking off his cravat to wind the long strip of linen around his throbbing arm. The House of Commons. Quickly! Chapter 59 What's all this, then? Tom demanded, struggling to thread the caracal through the tangle of chases, sedan chairs, gigs and hackneys that clogged Parliament Street from Whitehall 
to far beyond the Houses of Parliament and the Abbey. There's to be an inquiry this evening into the orders in council, Sebastian said, as the bells of the Abbey began to toll five o'clock. Men shouted and whips cracked. A donkey brayed. Ragged urchins and barking dogs darted past, the boys whooping and laughing. Looks like it's attracting the devil of a crowd. What time's the Prime Minister supposed to arrive? Five o'clock. From up ahead came the crash of splintering wood as a landau hooked one of its wheels with a coal cart. Bloody hell, said Sebastian, grasping the seat rail with his good hand. Pull up here. I can make better time on foot. He leapt from the curricle and started running. Pushing his way up Margaret Street, he cut across Old Palace Yard to the small former chapel that stood at right angles to Westminster Hall and served as the House of Commons. Bursting through the double doors, he found himself in a dark, low-ceilinged lobby crowded with a throng of spectators queuing patiently for a spot in the galleries. He knew a surge of relief. He wasn't too late. Glancing around, Sebastian snagged the arm of a self-important clerk bustling past and hauled him back. Where is Percival? Is he here yet? Tell me quickly, man. I say, sir, bleated the clerk, you're not allowed here in boots. He blanched as his gaze travelled from Sebastian's bare neck to his bloodied, hastily bandaged arm. And neck clothes are mandatory. Have you an introduction from a member? Because you really should have entered through the hall, you... Sebastian resisted the urge to shake the man. Damn you, I'm not here to gawk from the galleries. Where is Percival? A movement to one side of the lobby caught Sebastian's attention. A dark-haired man had risen from a seat near an open fire and was now walking briskly toward the entrance, one hand resting conspicuously inside his coat. Bellingham, said Sebastian. Then he bellowed, Bellingham, someone sees that man. Shocked faces turned not toward Bellingham, but toward Sebastian. With an oath, Sebastian surged forward. The clerk latched onto his wounded arm and held tight. Sir, I must insist. The slight figure of the Prime Minister appeared in the open doorway. He had his head half turned away, speaking to someone behind him. No, shouted Sebastian, shaking off the clerk just as Bellingham walked up to the Prime Minister and fired a single shot into Percival's chest from a distance of no more than three or four feet. As Percival stumbled back into the arms of the man behind him, Bellingham turned calmly and resumed his seat beside the fire. They carried the Prime Minister into the office of the Secretary of the Speaker. Someone called for a doctor, but one glance at the gaping, charred hole in Percival's chest was enough to tell Sebastian the Prime Minister was beyond any doctor's help. Sebastian looked around. You, he said, his gaze falling on the self-important clerk hovering nearby. Run to Downing Street. Tell his family what has happened. Run, he said again, when the man hesitated. Percival's hand fluttered. Spence, is he here? He's coming, lied Sebastian grasping the Prime Minister's hand. Already it felt cold. Percival sucked in a gasping breath that rattled in his throat. I would like to have seen him one last time before I... Sebastian leaned forward, straining to hear his words. But the Prime Minister only stared up with blank, unseeing eyes. Chapter 60 Paul Gibson thrust his needle through the flesh of Sebastian's forearm, stitching up the long gash left by Epson Smith's blade. You're lucky, said Gibson. He nearly sliced the tendon. Sebastian watched the Irishman work his needle in and out. I think you sew better than my tailor. Gibson tied off his thread and reached for a pair of scissors. You keep me in practice. Sebastian held out his arm to open and close his fist. It would be better if you rested it for a few days, said Gibson, turning away to smear salve on a bandage. Not that I expect you to pay me any heed. He began wrapping the bandage in place. What do you think they'll do to Bellingham? Hang him, I should think. Probably before the week is out. The man is obviously insane. 
Yes, but I doubt that will stop them. One thing I don't understand, said Gibson, busy with his task, is how the gentleman who stopped Miss Jarvis's carriage on the way back from Richmond fit into all this. He was probably another Hussar officer. He obviously wasn't at the birthday debauchery, but he must have been involved in the plot to goad Bellingham into shooting Percival. I suspect it was the four of them, Epson Smith, Somerville, Drummond, and the Richmond assailant, who attacked the Magdalene house. Epson Smith killed him to keep him from talking. You think there could be more mixed up in it? Sebastian thought about the men who had nearly lured Hero Jarvis to her death. But all he said was, I doubt we'll ever know exactly how many hussars were involved. Particularly if the Crown continues to insist that Bellingham acted alone. The sound of a carriage pulling up in the street outside drew Sebastian's attention. Even before he heard the knock on the door, before he heard the lilt of her voice as she spoke to Mrs. Federico, he knew it was Cat. She came in, bringing with her the scent of the night and the promise of more rain. She wore a sapphire blue carriage dress with cream braided trim and a matching pelisse, and as she paused on the threshold to Gibson's front room, the exquisite peacock feather of her jaunty blue hat curled down from the brim to rest against her pale cheek. He knew she hadn't expected to find him here. I beg your pardon, she said, her gaze focused resolutely on Gibson. I see you're busy. I'll come back later. She turned to go, but Gibson said, no, wait, let me just empty this and I'll be back. Picking up the basin of bloody water and soiled cloths, he walked out of the room. Her gaze fell to the bandage on Sebastian's arm. I'd heard you were wounded. It's just a cut. You could have been killed. I wasn't. He slid off the edge of the table but made no move to approach her. They stared at each other across the width of the room. Do you come here often, he asked, to see Gibson? Sometimes. They fell silent. For one stolen moment he lost himself in looking at her, at the familiar childlike tilt of her nose and the full curve of her lips. He would have sworn that the very air quivered with an aching awareness of all they had once been to each other, and all that they could never be again. She said, I must go. But still she lingered, her gaze on his. And he knew then, with a quiet rush of despair, that both this love and this pain would always be a part of him. And a part of her. Later that evening, Hero received a courteous note from Viscount Devlin, briefly detailing for her benefit the day's events and circumstances surrounding the Magdalen house killings. He told her of the quarrel between Rachel and Tristan Ramsay, but without the knowledge Hero had acquired from Lady Sewell, Rachel's subsequent fight would still have made no sense. She had no doubt that Devlin himself knew of Lord Fairchild's dark secret, and it irked her that Devlin had thought to protect her by withholding the information from her. She held the crisp white sheet of his letter a moment too long, then resolutely thrust it into the library fire before her. She was still in the library, curled up in an overstuffed chair beside the fire, and lost in the contemplation of the dancing flames when she felt her father's gaze upon her. She looked up to find him watching her from the doorway. No book, he said. His lips smiled, but his eyes were narrow with concern. She shifted uncomfortably beneath his regard, as if he might somehow detect the dangerous drift of her thoughts just by looking at her. To forestall him, she said, I heard Patrick Somerville is dead. Did you have him killed? No. It was my intention to do so, but he managed to beat me to it. Quinine and arsenic can be a deadly combination. He killed himself? Probably, although for the sake of his father, it will be ruled an accident. She tipped her head back against the seat cushion. So many deaths, she said quietly. Any decision yet on who will replace Percival? Jarvis snorted. I left Prinny and the rest arguing over whether to offer the premiership to Canning or Castlereagh, a moot point since neither man will take it. Between Bonaparte and the Americans, this is a damnable time to be without a prime minister. 
Percival might have been an ineffectual idiot, but he was better than no one. Will there be any repercussions from today's events? she asked with studied casualness. To Devlin's killing of Epson Smith, I mean. Hardly. Epson Smith attacked him. Oh, there'll be some talk, of course. But then there is always talk about Devlin. It will die down eventually. He stared at her for so long it took all of her sang-froid to continue holding his gaze. Devlin said there were three attempts on your life. I'm only aware of two. His enemies credited him with such omniscience that she'd worried he might somehow come to learn of those disastrous hours in the vaults beneath the ruined gardens of the old Somerset house. It was a relief to know that he had not. Perhaps, with time, she herself would be able to forget for days at a time that it had occurred. There was no third attempt. You lie well, he said, coming toward her, but not well enough yet to deceive me. Tipping back her head, she gave him a soft smile. No one can deceive you, Papa. Not for long. Remember that, he said. Reaching out, he touched her cheek briefly with his knuckles. It was the closest he ever came to a gesture of affection. Or an apology. It was the Earl of Hendon's habit every morning that he was in London to rise early and exercise his big grey in Hyde Park before breakfast. On the Tuesday following the death of Spencer Percival, the mist lay heavily on the rain-drenched grass. But the air held a new Christmas, a promise of the vital energy of a spring too long delayed in coming. Turning his black Arabian mare through the gates to the park, Sebastian could see the Earl trotting briskly up the row his body rising and falling in rhythmic precision with his horse's easy action. For a moment, Sebastian checked, the familiar drumming of the grey's hooves on the earth reverberating in the ghostly stillness. The urge to wheel the mare's head and simply ride away was strong. But still he sat, his reins held in a clenched fist. Through the mist, beyond the dark line of trees, he could see the spire of the abbey, and beyond that, the towers of the ancient palace of Westminster. He kept remembering the helpless longing he'd seen in Percival's face as the dying prime minister asked for his son with his last gasping breath. Sebastian's anger was still there, burrowed deep. The anger and the hurt. But something had shifted within him, and he knew now what he must do. Hendon had reached the end of the row. When he turned, his gaze fell on his son's rigid, solitary figure. Sebastian saw the Earl tense with a cautious, joyous hope. He felt the air damp against his face, the mare restless beneath him. Tightening his knees, he sent the mare flying forward across the park. Toward his father, and toward a reconciliation too long delayed. The End this is Davina Porter. We hope you have enjoyed this production of Where Serpents Sleep, a Sebastian Sincere Mystery by C.S. Harris. Recorded Books offers a wide selection of bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So look for us at your public library or on download sites online. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. Histories and more. So look for us at your public library or on download sites online. And thank you for being a recorded books reader. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.